may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, welcome, welcome to the Maasai Mara. There is a beautiful female cheetah and her single cub. They are very hungry and hopefully are going to be on the hunt very soon. This is Safari Live. to a sunny patch in the Maasai Mara. Uh, there are massive storms that are surrounding us, but at the moment we are happily in the sunshine with the gorgeous female cheetah. And she does young male with her. He's a bit older than Malaika's boys, so I'm not 100% sure who this female cheetah is. I suspect it could be a female Kuniale, but I'm going to have to reconfirm that. Not Malaika, so don't worry. Malaika has not lost one of her young boys. It is a different female cheetah, but very close to the area that I saw Malaika last week. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Sebastian on camera, and we are coming to you live from the gorgeous Masha Mara in Kenya. Now, of course, we are live. That means. <gasps> You can ask me questions as well as everyone else out, so you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live. Seven We've had a long day. Uh, we've lost them once briefly as they darted off into the croton thickets chasing something. They went from very flat to very speedy and uh, unfortunately they, for them they didn't catch anything. But they've slowly moved probably about two and a half, three kilometers and unfortunately the valleys that they're in at the moment are absolutely devoid of any potential prey. They also chased a reed buck through some thickets, but that reed buck was very, very fast. Fast, uh, sorry, fast, and was well aware of their presence. So they've slowed, they got up and moved about 200 meters a little bit earlier, and I'm hoping they're gonna move up towards us over the next hill, where I hope there is some potential you can see the young boy is quite fast asleep, but they are indeed hungry, hungry, hungry kitties. Now, the only other animal I can see presently is a giraffe way off in the distance. And I'm continuously checking around with my binoculars uh, to make sure that there's no potential prey around. And of course, little fits that could be. But, uh, of course, we're not going to see that till the cheetah almost on top of them. But no impala, no tommies, no sub-adult wildebeest or baby zebras close by that all fit this beautiful cat's potential prey. Now, well far away from us on the other side of the Mara, uh, Jamie is waiting to say hello. waiting to say hello indeed and basically on the opposite side of the Mara to Brent he's right close to the Tanzanian border I'm right up in the northern part of the triangle a very good afternoon my name is Jamie and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me and don't forget to send through all your questions and comments on hashtag live and for today is to go have a look at those elephants I've decided that's what the plan is for today and then <laughs> fly in my mouth and then we're going to go and find the Angama Pride that Taylor spent the morning with, go and see whether they have any luck in obtaining some dinner, and a chance for me actually, because I haven't seen the Angama Pride in ages, to go and see just how cubs the pig, cubs the pigs have got, big the cubs have got, an interesting mix up that one, how big the cubs have got, that's what I'm trying to say, I haven't seen them in a while. So that is our plan for the afternoon. I know that Brent has been with the lovely cheetah and her male cub. Hopefully we figure out exactly who she is. 
And then tomorrow we're going to go on an adventure across the river and go off in search of my favorite female cheetah, having met only a few of them in the Mara. But I'm going to go and see if I can find him money again. So that's the sort of plan. As you know, plans don't always go the way they're planned. Unfortunately, one of our vehicles is still out of commission. Poor Mila has, has taken a dive and just hasn't seemed to have recovered from it. Uh, hopefully, she's up and running for tomorrow. We'll see. We shall see. Oh, I've got to transfer my marshmallow pin button thing. I don't know what I'd call it. Okay, so all I've got to do is cross the main road. It's probably going to take me about, I don't know, about four minutes to get to the Ellie's and find ourselves a nice position to watch them. Depending upon our best route, but I think it would be around about four minutes or so. I'm still trying to decide whether to stay on one side of the lugger or the other. Okay, well, I make that decision. Let's send you back across to somebody in South Africa who is absolutely dying to say hello to you on this lovely afternoon. Indeed I am, Jamie. I'm not only dying to say hello, but I'm dying of... Well, asphyxiation from heat, I would imagine, is probably the best way to put it. It is a very, very warm day here on Juma, as you can see by our water bucks sitting in the shade. Now, as Jamie mentioned, my name is Tristan, and on camera today I've got Viam the Wildebeest once again, and we are going to be entertaining you for the next couple of hours. So remember, this is interactive, hashtag Safari Live, or YouTube chat if you'd like to ask any questions. And I was saying that it is extremely warm this afternoon. It is about 39 degrees Celsius, or a lovely 103 Fahrenheit, and the the sun feels like a little oven door has been opened and is blisteringly hot and so most of the animals at the moment are doing exactly like our waterbuck is doing and spending its time in the shade. You can see this waterbuck is even kind of bobbing its head in the heat as it tries to just cope with it. I would imagine of all the animals out here, waterbuck must have the worst time when it's hot like this. Those thick furry coats cannot be comfortable at all. Now this particular waterbuck you can actually see his coat is not very nice. He's got a bit of mange that's in there from the winter time so it is quite common to to see on waterbuck you'll be absolutely fine though you'll find once the summer's come through and he's gotten washed clean by the rain he'll eventually get rid of that but you can see look how he's almost bobbing as he's breathing quite rapidly just trying to cope with this heat it must be incredibly difficult to deal with hot weather like this when you're covered in that much fur i really do sympathize with these poor animals and I'll tell you what, if I was a waterbuck, I think I would be in the nearest dam and just sitting and wallowing in it. I think that's the best way to go about today. But you can see they are utilizing shade and trying to kind of stick to the shade as much as possible. Now, you know it's hot when we are driving around, and just now, VM and I came along quarantine, and the lapwings that normally populate quarantine and are running around all over the show and having a full-on game, well, they were all sitting in the smallest little sliver of shade of a marula tree, all piled up to there and, and looking very sorry for themselves. So it is a warm day, which means means that the start of our afternoon should be fairly quiet I would think. I don't think we're going to see too much to start. I think it's going to be a little bit hot. I think a lot of our animals are going to be in shade and in deep thickets just trying to kind of survive the hottest part of the day. Once it gets cooler though I think we're going to get a busy afternoon. I think we're going to have a situation where a lot of animals are going to come out of hiding, try and head towards water, get some sort of drink just to rehydrate after the warm weather that we've had today and it should mean that we're going to have a wonderful afternoon. I think I think what I'm going to do though is go and check Treehouse now quickly just to do our time lapse and then I want to try and head towards Chitwa because Hosanna was seen this morning killing a baby Dyker on Little Gauri but very close to the Chitwa cut line and I got a little insider tip that he was not there where he was left this morning by the guy that manages Little Gauri and his, apparently his tracks looked as though they were going towards the Chitwa cut line so we're going to go and scratch around there maybe we get lucky maybe we don't but it's worth a try and anyway Chitwa Dam will be absolutely perfect this afternoon for a place to go and spend. There's lots of activity there with the birds at the moment. Hippos, we should see some of the crocs around. Maybe crocs will be quite active given how warm it is. They could potentially see them hunting in the shallows. So there's lots of things to look forward to on the Chitwa side. I also hope that maybe the dam will have attracted some of our elephants. Maybe some ellies will be down at Chitwa Dam. That's what I'm really hoping for. But otherwise, we're just going to meander around and see what we can find. I did have some alarm calls 
of a kudu around Inga's house during the day today. I went and looked around. I can't, couldn't really see any tracks or anything like that. It's not to say that there isn't. You might find a situation where there's a few tracks or a few, um, or maybe a leopard that walked past or some sort of predator. So we'll head back there a little bit later when it's cooler on the way home and maybe we'll get lucky with whatever was causing the alarm calls to take place. But you can see just like this, the, the water buck, this impala is also now stuck in the shade and just trying to utilize any shade there is. Now I wonder if this is the sickly impala that we've been seeing lately. I think it is. You can see its hips are sticking out really really badly and this is an impala that is not in great condition at the moment and unfortunately I don't think is going to survive much longer especially if we've got heat like this it's going to be sapping every little bit of nutrients out of that individual what's wrong with it I don't know it just sometimes we do get animals out here that unfortunately get a little bit weak and get skinny like this and they fall foul to all of the dangerous animals that are out here so I would imagine something's going to get hold of it fairly shortly and even if it doesn't in skinny condition like that in heat and this oppressive hot sun that's out here I think it's going to be unfortunately a sticky end for this little one it's not ideal to see and, and I would have thought that we would have seen impala's condition increasing not decreasing so there might be some sort of disease that this poor impala has got it's difficult to say it's not foaming or anything like that or discharging any liquids from the nose or mouth i did see it the other day and i had a really good look at it so i don't know what's caused its bad condition but it's definitely not in the greatest place and and certainly if any predator sees it they might actually well, well they'll kill it quite quickly and if not the sun will probably take its toll as well so poor impala and i'm not going to sit too much with it i don't really want to disturb it plus it also makes me sad and I don't really want to be sad I want to try and be happy this afternoon and so I'm going to try not think of our poor skinny impala that I keep seeing he, he makes me a little bit on the bleak side and he's got a bit of a limp as well so I wonder if maybe he wasn't injured for a while and that's why he's not feeding very well and maybe why he's in a situation where he's not looking that good Colleen, you were saying maybe he's just old. No, so that's not an old impala at all, Colleen. And the reason why I say that is because if you looked at his horn structure, his horns were actually quite small and underdeveloped. So they, he's an animal that I would say is probably about two and a half years old, two -ish, around there. So that's his kind of age. And, and it means that his horns would have grown a lot more if he was an older individual. He also would have had a lot more tatty ears. His ears are still quite fine. So I think it's more that he's got some sort of disease. Maybe it's, or an injury. I see there's a nice big scar on his leg front shoulder so maybe this injury has taken a lot of energy out of him and maybe now that it's healed he might start getting a little bit of nutrients if it starts to rain well that will help him a little bit as well so I'm going to carry on down to Trials Dam we're going to do our time lapse quickly and so while I do that I believe Jamie has found a bird of prey and so before it flies away let's jump back across all the way to the Mara Look what we've found for you. It is so well hidden, it's actually really rather difficult for us to show it to you. This is actually spotted by Craig, who's got fantastic eyes. He's a long crested eagle, but it is, it basically looks like it's part of this tree up against the sky. The sky is dark, cloudy, and gloomy, and getting darker and cloudier and gloomier by the minute. <laughs> You're very dramatic, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one of the smallest eagle species that we see out here, but one with a very dramatic crest that looks very much like it's got some kind of mohawk. And I'm trying to think what particular band this particular eagle would listen to, if, of course, eagles listen to music. A bit of Marilyn Manson, maybe? I feel as though it would be something quite quite deep and punk rockery. Megan, do you have any suggestions? Meg, of course, is directing us this afternoon. <clears throat> Meg, what do you think? What music would this bird listen to with that mohawk? There's definitely something in there. <laughs> Even the movements make it look like it should. Jared, Jared is on our tech team. He's in final control. He says Metallica. I can see it. Metallic is definitely an option. What has it seen? It's seen something above it that it's really interested in. I think it might... I mean, the eyesight is so good it might be something behind us, but... It, what are you looking at? What are you after? <laughs> we 
are you just listening to the music in your head? I mean, the, the angle that its head's at makes me think it's something in the tree itself. That it's, it's caught its attention. Perhaps some kind of an insect. I mean, they will eat insects. They tend to go for larger prey. But as a smaller eagle species, it would be on their menu. There we go. It's surely going to fly now. And the whole posture's poised to leap. Or is it that wasp that's fluttering around it? Maybe that's what it is. The buzzing wasp is maybe irritating it. They're birds that we definitely haven't spent enough time with. They're quite fascinating. Of course, we don't really see them on Juma. And that's one of the nice differences here in the Mara, is we get to catch up with birds like this. What are you after? Still looks poised to leap. I'm trying to see if I can figure it out. Maybe it's just a change in posture. <laughs> oh, Fox Hat, I should have got there before you did. Well done. Fox Hat says they maybe listen to the eagles. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I definitely think you win that round, Fox Hat. Absolutely, the eagles it is. Come on. We're still sort of within the long crested eagle's breeding season as well. And I don't think we've found one long crested eagle nest since we've been out here in the Mara, but we do see the individual. We get to know regular pairs that we see in certain areas. And they have most of their eggs are laid around about between July and November. So this is the way that long-crested eagles hunt. So they don't hunt like, say, the martial eagle or some of the other eagle species that we see or even the harrier species. They are they sit in the trees and they wait for something to catch their attention. They don't fly, they don't glide over the plains and search for food in that way. They wait the trees essentially is pop out and go scurrying below them and then what they'll do is they'll swoop down from quite a short height if you compare it to a martial eagle that actually does or even a peregrine falcon for example that does a long dive and gathers speed and momentum that the, the long crested eagle doesn't really hunt in that way and of course goes for much smaller prey so it doesn't need the full weight and momentum of that dive to catch and kill whatever it's after. Okay. Well, it doesn't seem to have launched itself off its branch, and it is quite well hidden. Richard, you say you think the eagle's waiting to catch a rodent. And that's one of the reasons why I'm torn, Richard, in terms of staying here, because at one point it really did look like it was going to swoop down. And as I said, that's the way that they hunt. They sit in the branches like this. If we saw something like a martial eagle sitting up in a tree, we would say it's unlikely to swoop down and hunt something. But because their behavior is so different, I think that is a possibility. That's why I've been sitting here while I've been chatting to you, half distracted, trying to into the eye but unfortunately no matter how hard I try my eyesight will never ever be as good as a bird's their eyesight is spectacular and far more accustomed to picking up tiny movements like rodents moving through grass should we have a little look I it sort of looked like it was looking upwards Ah, oh, there we go. Stop to have a grooming session. I think if something did catch its attention, it's no longer focused on it. 
gives an, it gives you an idea. Oh, there we go. Bye. Off to new purchase, perhaps. So about to say it gives you an idea. The tree swaying away. Oh, nice, Craig. Looks like it dislodged another bird. Where is it going to land? Okay. No, wait, hold on, we're gliding back again. It's circling. I think it's circling a new perch. Very nice, Craig. And thus ends our long crested eagle sighting. Onwards to try and get to those elephants. But I did promise you elephants, but they all moved away from the road. As seems to happen to me quite a lot. They've moved away from the road quite fast and now are very far away. So we're going to go off in search of the next herd, which is just around there. And while we go off in search of elephants, it sounds as though Tristan has left Treehouse Dam. Let's go find out where he's going. I have indeed. I've left Treehouse Dam because Treehouse Dam was eerily quiet. Even the Egyptian goose left when I came down or when we came down and so not really much going on at Treehouse Dam. It's actually been quite strange because I think this is the longest period we've had without activity at the dam itself. It's really been a hot spot for us over the last few months and it's been a wonderful place to go and check and, and to always kind of start our drives and it's amazing how many animals that we've actually picked up at that dam. So nothing there for now but that's okay it's gonna give us an opportunity to go and explore a little bit and to go and see what else is around I'm hoping that maybe if we go and check Shabamu side there might be some sort of sign of shadow and cub I don't know I'm just really driving around also just trying to find some sort of tracks to work with whether that be elephants or even buffalo maybe one can hope um, leopard whatever there is I don't know I'm, I'm open to suggestions maybe we should have a suggestions as to what people would like to see this afternoon hashtag safari live on what you think we should find or what we're going to find this afternoon on our drive I'm open to any ideas as to where anybody wants to go I think hyena den though for those that want to do hyena den I'm fully supportive of it but I think we're going to leave that for a lot later so let's see if we can maybe find something else in the meantime I, like I say hashtag safari live what you want to see and where you think we should maybe check to go and find what you want to see. Ah, so Roshni and many others are wondering how our pancake and maple syrup breakfast went. Well, I think it was a resounding success. Amanda even had to bake some, well, make some more, not bake, but make some more. She had to make a few extra ones because there were a few hungry fellas around that asked for more. And so everybody climbed into pancakes, enjoyed the maple syrup. It was thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable and very tasty. And so it was a wonderful, best maple syrup era ever, Vildi ever ever so I think Vildi at one point had more maple syrup than pancake but that's okay Vildi it's the way you should do it and it was really it was very good so Amanda makes really good pancakes and we had a really nice sort of breakfast with the whole crew around the table and there was lots of laughing and lots of carrying on and so it was a really nice little morning so thank you all for asking and, and it would have been I don't think much better I don't think we could have made it any better do you think so Vildi I don't think so I think our pancakes were as good as they could be I know some people don't like maple syrup but well it was good and we enjoyed it so that's all that matters I suppose right let's not hit the aerial on this marula now I need to just concentrate and focus are we good there Vildi I think we're gonna be okay yeah we're all right it's because I've once went under that little archway of that marula and hit the aerial which is not ideal so I believe some of you have let us know where we should be going and what we should be finding uh, Mac with the sea and Eric elephants is on your list well I think that's on the very top of my list to start with as well so hopefully we're going to be able to find them I really have missed herds of elephants I, I can't even tell you the last time I saw a really nice herd and spent a long time with them so I'm hoping that that's going to be on the agenda this afternoon I really do hope that we're gonna have a situation where we can have lots of Ellie's around and babies and playing and 
particularly if it was at a water hole, that would be even better. But I'll take elephants anywhere at this stage. It would just be really nice to spend some time with a nice big group of elephants and just get amongst the herd and watch the dynamics and watch the playfulness that encompasses a herd of elephants. So it would be nice. That's, I think, a really good call. I'm certainly up for that and hope that somewhere along the line we will find them. It's interesting that we haven't seen too many of them. I'm a bit surprised. Michael, I didn't hear exactly what you wanted to say, but I'm guessing that you say pangolin, if I may be incorrect there, Megan. Yes, there we go. So pangolin. Well, Michael, I would love to see a pangolin. And then it seems as though the pangolin luck all lies to the west of us at the moment, because the guys on Elephant Plains, Arethusa and... Simbambili are having an absolute ball with pangolins. They last week I think saw a pangolin three or four times, you know, two different pangolins apparently. So hopefully our time will come and we've just got to keep driving and keep looking and keep trying and eventually we'll get lucky. It's just one of those animals that that's the way it is. It's not something that is easy to find but any day can be the day and, and any time can be the time. So hopefully we will get lucky. We've got a bit of a cold front coming this weekend and actually pangolins are really we see them quite a bit when you get that rainier kind of weather. It's because it's darker during the day, it allows them to come out a little bit um, earlier in the evenings or later in the mornings, and they then have to have soft substrate to be able to dig in, and so you find the pangolins are fairly active in wetter, cooler weather than they are in hot weather like this. So it's not to say that you don't find them in hot weather. I've seen pangolins in, in days exactly like this, just at, in, at the night, or in the night, should I say? I don't know why I'm saying, mixing my English up today. It's strange but anyway and maybe the hot air is cooking my brain but I would imagine that we'll have a situation where if we get a bit of a cold front that will be better conditions than what we see now it's now is not that good although it is possible but I wouldn't mind I wouldn't say no to a pangolin Vildi would you say no to a pangolin what about a leopard with a pangolin Vildi that's a good thing we should aim for today with elephants at the same place a caracal playing with a pangolin. Well, Vildi, you have the caracal luck. You were with Taylor when this. Yeah. Here we go. Exactly. So, VM's got all the caracal luck. It's the only caracal, as far as I know, that has been shown on Safari Live. And so, if we're going to see a caracal, well, it should be with VM. I, I think that's a fair call. And VM and I had an interesting discussion, actually, this afternoon. And one that left me giggling for quite some time and really did... Um, make me smile. VM said to me, what, what do I think if we had to dress up a rutting impala in a leopard costume? What would happen? And whether or not it would cause absolute chaos. Now, can you imagine the scene of, a of an impala that's got horns? It's now dressed up fully in a leopard costume. VM even said we should foam around the legs so that the legs are a bit thicker and then we're going to get a motorized tail that's going to wag as well. And this leopard is going to, I mean this impala, well we'll call it an impala for now, and it will then go around rutting and chasing all the other males and females. And of course the females and other males are not going to have the cooking clue that this is actually a impala and not a leopard and it will just be quite interesting in terms of what is happening now we're just at Janet Jackson's hideout no sign of Janet Jackson I'm afraid it seems as though Janet Jackson has decided this is far too hot for her or him and has decided to probably vacate now Kaylin you wanted to see Janet Jackson and Janet Jackson's not playing the game anymore Kaylin we have not seen Janet Jackson for quite some time in fact the last time I saw it was about four or five weeks ago so we'll just have to keep trying and plugging away maybe Janet Jackson has found itself a summer home where it's not as hot as this one this one is in the direct sunshine so in the summer like now I can imagine inside that tree is really hot and I would imagine this Janet has maybe found itself somewhere with a bit more shade than what we're seeing here it's, I can tell you from where we're sitting, if it's anything like that, like it is here, it's going to be very warm inside that tree itself and quite stuffy. Right, now I'm going to meander quickly to Twin Dams, and Twin Dams did give us a few little gremlin issues this morning. So while I quickly go check there, let's go back to Brent Leo Smith, who hopefully his gremlins will behave with those beautiful spotted cats. thinking we're live I think we lost comms there so everyone there's some big storms so it can also comms break up but we are still with what I think is Miale and her young male now the temperatures drop some of the storms have got a bit closer to us so I'm thinking 
and I'm hoping that they might move. And if they move, they might move a little bit higher onto the ridge, uh, which hopefully give us a bit of a better signal in comms. But they are really, really hungry, so I don't want to leave them. A massive herd of giraffes have moved on to the opposite hill. There were one or two earlier. There's a whole bunch on that hill. The only thing that we were last year was a single, or no, two zebras. Adults are a little bit too big for our lovely cheetah here. Yeah, well, let's hope that these cheetah move into a bit of a better area uh, while we do that. And let's go across to Jamie and some elephants. Hey, look at this tiny little creature while Brent goes off in search of a better area. We've got a really, really tiny baby elephant. I think it was Daniel two days ago who asked me to find a baby elephant and I didn't really succeed. I, uh, we found a few, but they were quite far away. But look at this. <laughs> this is really small. I had to guess. I mean, it's still a little wobbly on this whole walking process. It really, really is small. And too sweet. Earlier on, it was dashing about backwards and forwards. It's so small, it fits perfectly underneath mum. Happy sheltered position. Hey, excuse me, madam. <laughs> you're... No, you're standing in our way, and all we can see is a little bit of its head. Here it comes. Too precious. Oh, this is a really young elephant. It's not newborn, but it is very young. And you can see, I mean, the the whole walking thing is still a little bit confusing. We've got the running. Here you go. Look, yes, very impressive. Oh, be careful. There's holes out here. Got to watch for the holes. Went a bit far there. Back to the safety of mum. Back underneath mum. Proper little mama's girl. I actually don't know if it's a girl or a boy. I can't see properly. But it's such an uneven surface for little elephant legs. Uh, sorry, Megs. I absolutely can't hear you. I got every couple of words. So I know that you guys are sending through your questions. I apologize. Hannah, you're amazed at something. That much I can, I can, I can hear. You're amazed at something to do with the mother. Uh, beyond that, I, I can't quite hear what you're amazed at the mother is doing. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Are you amazed? I'm sorry, Megs. Maybe, maybe Faith can try, and I can hear it through from her. There's a guinea fowl behind them as well. Briefly saw it. Okay, cool. Hannah, hold on to your question. When I can hear it properly, I promise you I'll answer it. Oh, down into the forest. Down into the forest. Oh dear, I hope they decide to come out the other side and they don't stop and feed in there. It's not looking likely though, is it? And now all we can see is Mum's back. And one guinea fowl. One lost guinea fowl. What are you doing over there? No, two lost guinea fowls. So not so lost then. Three guinea fowls. Oh my goodness. Are oh, we spoiled this afternoon? I really, really, really would love to show you the footage of Imani playing with the guinea fowl. It was truly hilarious. Ah, uh, I thought that's what Hannah was asking. Hold on, Hannah. Shall we see if we can get a little bit closer? So Hannah's comment was actually not a question. It was saying that um, she was a that doesn't step on the baby. Elephants have the most exceptional. She's registering movement and calculating and 
and creating this depth of field around her or a perception of a depth of field and it's actually one of the within their brains they've got nerve pathways that are in the thicket so it really is quite hard for us to see so Hannah I agree with you it's amazing to watch how delicate elephants are and it's not just with with little ones it makes sense that they'd be extra cautious with little ones but the way that they delicately step around obstacles I, I found their dung in the strangest of places somewhere that I even struggled to climb up and yet somehow an elephant had made its way up to the top of a little outcrop of rot, rocks Oh, she's going to come out the other side. That would be so nice if she did. I'm sure there's plenty of nice stuff to eat in there, though. Come on, Mum. Come show us your baby again. It's so cute. Everybody loves babies. Richard, it's very common to see an elephant with one tusk bigger than the other. Um, a lot of the time grow but also elephants most elephants are left either left tusked or right tusked like human beings are either usually either right-handed or left-handed so what they have is what's known what's been sort of termed in in behavioral books and, and papers as the master tusk and slave tusk so one tusk is used more often than it, and as a result gets worn down and becomes much much shorter so in the process of digging, in the process of scraping away at bark, personally, <clears throat> the one thing that we have noticed, <laughs> guinea fowls, really want to be in the sick. <laughs> it just... <laughs> one thing that I've noticed, to, to go back to the question on tusks rather than, than guinea fowls, is the, is the fact that the tusks on average Obviously, you get individuals like this female with short tusks, but on average, their tusks are much longer than those in South Africa. And I wonder if it hasn't to do with what they eat. For, you know, seven, eight months of the year, the elephants on Juma have to feed on the branches and the bark of trees, whereas out here in the Mara, they've got a much longer period of time where they can feed on grass. And you only really see them feeding off acacias because they like them, and the Balanites seed pods, but otherwise it's the small shrubs and grasses. There we go. Surprise! Made it. Oh, you've made the climb as well. Oh dear, we're going back down again. No, no, no. Oh, oh, uneven footing. Reverse, 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 fall down. Reverse, saved it. <laughs> Sit down. Oh dear, bye bye. Kerry, she should actually be with the rest of her herd now, and in fact, I think you'll probably find they're not far from her. It might be that the reason that she's a little bit separate is because this baby is newer than we thought, but yes, she will go back to the rest of the herd. She'll go back to the rest of the herd soon. You might find that this is a daughter, an older daughter, that now has a baby sibling to help mum take care of, and it might be that she decided to stay behind with mum when she gave birth. Come on. You can come out, but usually the mother rejo rejoins the herd. Either she gives birth with the herd, or she actually rejoins the herd almost immediately afterwards. Oh dear, I think, I think this hill has just proved insurmountable to the little one. But they are going to come out, so let's see how it plays out. Hi. We're under scrutiny. Not just guinea fowl. Been joined by some giraffe as well. Hello. Didn't even see you sneaking up on me. Giraffe. Elephant. What a lovely sighting. <coughs> and they're going to they're going to walk right across the skyline. This is stunning. And if it's, if I, unless I've got babies on the brain, which I don't think so, I think that female's pregnant. She looks pregnant to me. She looks quite round-bellied. It's definitely baby time in the morrow. Baby topies, baby tommies, warthogs, elephants. 
zebra by the dozen. Here come the rest of them. Little <laughs> that one at the back just stubbed its toe. <laughs> I saw it happen. I mean, it didn't stub its toe because obviously its toe is a hoof, but it, it stubbed its wrist joint and tripped slightly and got such a fright it went galloping off after the rest of them. It was entirely your doing. Okay, I'm just going to try a quick reposition for when this elephant does come out. Because I really want to see the baby again, basically. Oh, but there's some quite steep holes, so hold on everyone, I don't want to find one of them. No, it's the one thing that elephants can't do. Can't do. They can't jump. Um, even at, even at a very young age. At a young age, you'll see them skip. You'll see them dance around, but you won't ever see all of their feet leave the surface of the ground at the same time. There we go. Is this this car's got plenty of space to go around. So Palin, no, elephants are not able to jump. I have seen an elephant with all four legs off the ground, but it was climbing a tree at the time, climbing onto a fallen marula tree. But while they are unable to jump, they are quite limp for some such as they are. They run fast. Oh, Mom, don't go down that way. We, we came to see your baby. Hi, guys. Jumbo. Here we go. Little one coming out again. Well, older one coming out again. Oh dear. I guess it's just not to be. I hadn't noticed that. So Lissa's observation is that on average the, the Ellie's and the Mara are less wrinkled than they are in South Africa. Could that be due to a wetter climate? I guess what it could be due to is a colder climate, maybe? I mean, their wrinkles do play a role in thermoregulation, so it's not just their ears. I'm sorry, it's got really chilly. I'm going to put my jacket on at the same time. Um, their, their wrinkles do play a role in thermoregulation, first of all by increasing surface area, but oh, here we come, here we come. Quite the slope you've, <laughs> you've created for your little one, madam. Um, and maybe because, I mean, wrinkles help to retain the mud that the Ellie's bathe in and, and it keeps them cooler for longer. I, I hadn't noticed that they were less wrinkly. Perhaps the anti-aging cream is more readily available here. No, I'm, I really don't know. I hadn't noticed that at all. It's an interesting observation. Come on, little one, you can do it. You can do it. It's quite a big hill, but you can do it. Or maybe not. No, downhill's easier. This baby has not moved from in between mom's legs all that much. Definitely has got that wonky look of a, an almost newborn calf. Can we see an umbilical cord? It's a girl. It's a little girl. Uh, Kerry, we haven't seen a, an elephant being born during the drive live. We've come very, very close three times on three separate occasions. Once on Juma, where we saw it. Guinea fowl alarm call. Sorry, hold on. Where are you alarm calling from? Oh, it's a bird. Never mind. It is a bird. Bird of prey causing the guinea fowl alarm calls. Thought it might be a leopard. Um, so yes, we've come very close. Juma, where one was a few years old, a few, few hours old, stumbling down. Brent found the placenta and then we found the little one with fangs hurt. 
and then tomorrow she didn't broadcast live because some technical difficulties and then the second time was a few days ago where we came very close and unfortunately that was an instance where the little baby didn't make it it's always lovely to see them happy and healthy even if they're a little bit. so we've come close but I I've I've come close three times I've never seen an elephant being born I've seen videos of an elephant being born but I've never experienced it in real life and it really really would one day we're gonna get it and we're gonna get it here in the Mara because it's much more open so the females tend to give birth out in the open rather than being hidden away in the trees and which that means we can actually see them because we you know with when a, an elephant's giving birth it might be a very sensitive time for her she might be a little bit more on edge so on Juma if, if she's hidden behind trees it's almost impossible for us to follow her and to get a good position to watch her <laughs> this, this mum's slowly making her way up the hill she's basically acting as a a stumbling block for the little one every time it makes a, a faulty move up the hill Here's the lovely thing about baby elephants. They suck their trunks for comfort. Like babies suck their thumbs or a dummy. What would you, what do you call dummies in <laughs> you don't call them dummies. Dummies is pacifier. Pacifier. There we go now. Faith is, is helping Megan in the director's seat, and I happen to know that she really, really loves Ellie's. So there you go, Faith. A nice little baby elephant for you. <laughs> so cute. Gary, no. Mummy, uh, Mummy Ellie, sorry. We're not in the school drive yet. Um, mother elephants do not hide their little ones in long grass. So they will, the, the way that elephants protect their babies is not like a topi. A topi, for example, or a mummy will actually lie completely still hidden in the grass. Elephants rely on their sheer size and the protection of the rest of the herd. So they will actually band together. The, the babies form such a critical part of the herd's social structure. They will actually band together to protect them. And there's very few... Look at that. There you go, getting a little nudge. <coughs> Past the bushes. Oh, that's too sweet. Actually basically getting shoved out the way so that mom could come past. <laughs> There's something ancient about baby elephants. And I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's the the wrinkly skin and the, the paper thin skin and the sort of the the weak walk. I don't know. I don't quite know how to explain what I mean. Like little Benjamin Button, the baby elephant that we saw a few months ago. So mom, uh, female elephants will actually protect their babies purely by aggression. If I were to get out with that baby being as small as she is, if I were to go and walk towards that mother with intent, she would probably, now there's a very good chance that she would flatten me. Because she does have a very particularly strong protective instinct when that baby is as small and vulnerable as it is at the moment. Are we going to see some suckling? No. That baby looks a little bit confused as well. I really think it is very young. And it's still got pink on the inside of its ears. She looks like quite an old girl to me. The mum. She's got very sunken bones around her face, or at least sunken skin around the bones of her face. Quite a prominent skeleton. I think the mum's quite old. Over 40 at least. So this is not her first little one. She will have had a good few more before this. You can see the really dramatic skies over the Mara. 
Uh, it's the rainy season, so you're probably going to hear us say, once the sun sets safari, I think it's going to rain. And it usually does. There we go. Stepping around, little one. <laughs> okay, while we watch our little baby elephant stumble off at what could be described as quite a slow speed, let's go across to something that's capable of much faster speeds. Well, not very fast at the moment. They have not moved yet. They are still sitting very, very still. The temperature has dropped. There's a big storm behind us. It looks like, gratefully, it's going to miss us. And it looks like, gratefully, the storm between us and final control has also made its way away. So hopefully we do have a bit more of a stable feed at the moment. So we can actually see the escarpment now behind Lookout Hill, uh, which we couldn't earlier and I think that might have been causing a bit of our problems. There is still quite a lot of rain around. But there you go. You can just see Lookout Hill. Oh, where's my hand? And camps about there somewhere behind those trees. But we can see the escarpment through the trees now. So hopefully our lovely cheetah is going to get moving. So there we go. You can see the escarpment way in the distance there and camps up there somewhere. So we can see camp again, which is lovely. And uh, so far, not much happening yet. But patience is the key when it comes to the big cats. As the longer we sit here, the better chance we've got of seeing something spectacular. Now, I couldn't think of many better ways to spend the day, as Sebastian and I have, the whole day with the cheetah. Of course, nothing too much has happened yet, but that can change in a split second. A Thompson's gazelle might meander over the hill. Oh, heads up, that's a good sign. It's been relatively flat for the last while. So any bit of a potential, or looking like a potential bit of movement, is always good. We are just such elegant creatures. Now, for those of you who watched last week where I spent a lot of time with Malaika, you should definitely be able to see the difference. Um, she seems to have quite a much more elongated face than Malaika does. And uh, as I say, I'm going to have to confirm with the researchers, but I'm pretty sure, just from what I've heard, a female cheetah who does have one young sprog is Miali. Now, I could be wrong. This could be a cheetah. I don't know. She could have popped in for a visit from Tanzania. And that's the joy of being in an open ecosystem like this. You never, never know what might pot up. Eric, watching this cat is so relaxing. Indeed it is. Uh, Sebastian and I have had quite a relaxing day. Uh, we even managed to have a a little nap while the cats were napping at each of us. Um, well, it was quite hot today during the heat of the day. So while the cats were napping, uh, we took we took the chance to have a little nap as well. And uh, it was it was quite pleasant, apart from all the flies. But yeah. you get you get the flies. yeah, Sebastian as apart from the flies. I, I've got used to the flies. I think I've been, I've been dealing with them for about six months now, so they don't seem to bother me as much. But, um, yeah, so it has been a quite interesting day. And it's always lovely to listen to the different sounds and that happen out here. Lots of different sounds. And how the sounds change throughout the day. And now that the temperature has dropped a little bit, there's a whole host of new birds. Kerry's wondering the animals turn their back. Uh, Kerry, no, not, not, not with cheetah. Lions, hyenas, definitely, and even leopards. Um, 
because cheetah get quite worried during those big rainstorms that possibly they might be snuck upon by a lion or something like that. So I'm just ha having a look at my bino, seeing if there's something in these bushes close by. Not that I can see. This looks a little bit more alert than she was earlier. Maybe she can hear something. <laughs> All I can see is some doves, which have become very loud in the last little while. Oh no, she's definitely seen something. I can't see what it is. I'm going to keep checking. They could, as I said, reed buck um, and duck duck in these thickets. Uh, possibly a stand book as well. It could be a little scrub hare. You never know, it could be a lion or a leopard. Um, I think everyone's a bit worried about my audio there. No, it's when I lift my binoculars. <laughs> that unfortunately gets between my, my mic and my mouth. But I do need my binoculars to see what's going on. <laughs> now remember, this is 100% live, so those little uh, lovely nuances will happen from time to time. Um, we're just checking our audio. And Sebastian says it doesn't make sense. Our levels are all good outside. Well, there we go. James Richard says he thinks I'm right. It looks like Miale to me. Oh, now, James, I've never seen Miale, so that's why I'm not 100% sure, but I assume it to be Miale. When we get a chance to see her young boy on the move, he's got a very distinctive spot pattern. Um, along the base of his tail with the spots are very very close together so hopefully we'll be able to see that and I think for me that's going to definitely be one of the more recognizable things oh, well. no, I, can't. I mean literally this is so uncommon in the Mara. I'm glassing with my binoculars over all the hills around us and I can't see one Tommy, one Impala, one Grant not even a Wildebeest or a Zebra well the Wildebeest are all gone Now, hi, Rhonda. Rhonda's wondering about the black markings behind the cheetah's ears. And uh, do all cats have those? Uh, the big cats in Africa do. And uh, it is a following mechanism for the youngsters. So the cubs are able to spot that and follow her through the long grass. Same as the white tip to the tail. So black and white in solid masses uh, stick out to the predators a bit more than, than other things because of the way their eyes work. No, I think she's decided it was a false alarm. She is still alert, so I do think she is going to get moving, especially now that the temperature's dropped a good five or six degrees. It's probably around 27, 28 uh, when the heat was on. Now the cloud has sort of put a dampener to that. There's a massive storm uh, to the west of us. I mean, we might not even get a sunset today. There's so much cloud cover towards the west, so straight in front of us. There we go. Look at that, and that's just all massive clouds. Now, you can't actually see the main body of the storm is right up above, and these are just clouds below it. So the anvil of this storm is, above, is, is right, way up high above us, but the rain itself is still quite far from us. Now, I want her to go east, away from the storm. Now, there was another storm behind us, but fortunately for us, it's blown to the south. Uh, we've been quite lucky today. We've had a couple of big storms that we thought we were going to get very wet. And uh, they've sort of just passed a couple of kilometers to either side of us on both occasions that they came very close. She is interested in something down Sorry, Megs, you broke up a bit during that question. Can you go again? Uh, I heard it was from Shivam, but I didn't catch the grasp of it. Ah, Shivan would like to know what is the lifespan of a cheetah. In captivity, they've it's said to be live up to about 18, 20 years. In the wild, seldom beyond sort of 13, 14 um, for females and younger for males. Now, it is quite tough being a cheetah, being the smallest of the big predators. Often, 
your kills are stolen from you and often well lions actually the biggest killer of, of cheetahs out here in the african bush so they are quite quite vulnerable to the bigger predators and will use their fleet feet to try and escape them now you might be able to hear that in the distance that which is the black-bellied bastard. I can't actually see him, but uh, I can hear him calling in the grass somewhere around us. And there are some birds coming in. I'm just going to see if we can spot one with the camera. I heard some babblers a bit earlier in this little croton thicket. They've gone quiet now. And it's about... Well, that is... The, oh, he's taking... No, I think he's still there. Oh, he's still there? Yeah. Uh, just wait. No, there we go. Well, I could hear him calling before I saw him. And uh, there we go. And that's a lovely little cysticula. And it is um, a rattling cysticula. Now, I've got a slightly different call here to the rattling cysticulas back home on Juma. Of course, there are quite a few different cysticular species. We've seen quite a few of them now. Um, the pectoral patch, the uh, stout, and I'm trying to think what other one we saw a while ago. That was quite a good one. Now, there is a another cysticular that is quite difficult to see, but hopefully as we extend our... Our range in the morrow we're going to be able to see the black back testicular now I have seen them in the Mara but in an area where we unfortunately don't have signal yet down on the Tanzanian border so the black backed testicular and I know Tristan would really love to see a black back testicular and it is a very limited range throughout Africa. So let's see what Tristan has to say about cysticulars in general. Well, that they make a lot of noise, Brent, here in the Sabi Sands. The rattling cysticula is quite chirpy and quite full of nonsense and gives us a hard time quite a lot of the time. But he's right. I would like to see those black back cysticulars, and they do have a very limited range down here. And so we don't see them in the Sabi Sands, unfortunately, which is not so nice. At this stage, though, I would take any cysticular really to see because it's been awfully quiet. We've driven a little bit of the Mulawati. We didn't see any tracks other than what looked like Hosanna's tracks from the night. We had him at Twin Dams and where he then went south towards Little Gauri. So not much happening on Juma. We checked, like I say, around Central. We've checked um, Batalia. We've checked those water holes. And so all very quiet. I think it's still too hot, really, for a lot of things to be moving. I think if anything is around, it's going to be in some deep shade. And so we're just really bumbling around as slow as we can just to try and get this heat out of the day out of the way. And then we'll start to hopefully see things coming around i was hoping to try and find some tracks somewhere of ellie's but alas it seems like nothing coming in from torchwood nothing from the south that i can pick up either which is not ideal so hopefully chitwa will have some hidden surprises now i did get an update as well of Mvula, so we haven't heard his name for a few weeks and it's definitely been a little bit kind of quiet on his side and it's surprising because we haven't seen too much of Tingana either and so I would have thought Mvula would have spent quite a bit of time with us and, and, and around but he seems to obviously have been in Buffalzook having a fat jaw up there and a jaw in South Africa means a party so he's been having a fat party basically is how we would say it. Now he's basically been walking around and from what I can gather last night decided that he would have a little bit of a different dinner. Normally we would find that they would go after mostly antelope and various other things but it seems as though Mvula has decided he's going to try civet for dinner. So apparently he's got a civet kill that he is finishing off from last night. Now I don't imagine civet tastes very good given that they eat a whole bunch of cyanide filled creatures in the form of millipedes and various other things. I suppose though we do eat coffee that comes from them which is obviously the coffee beans are eaten and then defecated and we do use that every now and then and it's also in a number of ladies perfumes in the form of the anal gland secretion that is then harvested and put in perfumes in a lot of the French perfumes in fact and so it is quite 
weird to think that a lot of ladies are wearing civet as they walk around it's quite a strange thing it's a binding agent for the scent and that's why they use it but uh, nowadays there's a lot of other chemicals that they can use and it's it's not as popular as it used to be in the early days so that's where Mvul is and that's what he's been up to and what he's been doing um, I don't think we will see any sign of him this afternoon I'm just pretty sure if he's got a kill he's going to be fairly uncomfortable and fairly relaxed and, and will probably take a bit of time to rest he's also quite far north in Buffalzook a lot further north than I would expect him you know to be and, and for him to move towards us would probably take quite a bit of time so we're not going to worry about him for too much I'm just now on cheetah cut line in case Tundi was moving back this way I don't see any sign of any tracks coming over I think ultimately like I say it's so hot and we were at Ch Cheetah Cut Line this morning, already quite late in the morning. So I don't think she will come back just yet, but it was worth a chance and worth a, a little look just to see. And what I'm going to do now is we're going to go explore Chitwa. So we're going to go and see different places on Chitwa. We're going to go and try and check all around the back areas, areas that we haven't really been able to drive, given that our signal used to be quite bad there. So I'm going to just try and test it out and just go and explore, really. There's lots of dense thickets there that are great for shade, and maybe we find something interesting in all of those shady areas that's the kind of idea anyway that's really kind of all that we got planned and then to the dam a little bit later JBV you're asking how long does it take to drive the length of Juma well it depends if we are driving north south or east west but let's let's go north south if I had to start on the northern boundary and just drive straight south I would probably take me if I drive at this speed maybe about 15 minutes 20 minutes so not very far at all and east west slightly longer about 20 20 minutes probably maybe a little bit more and um, if you obviously if you're spotting things and stopping then a lot longer but it's really not that big and not that far it's at the end of the day 900 hectares is a little drop in the ocean that is the Kruger National Park the Kruger National Park is 2.2 million hectares so when you think of 900 and 2.2 million it's not a very big area and it means that we do have a situation where we can cross it quite quickly now in some days it's a little bit of a sort of negative thing because animals move out of it but on other days it's really quite nice and the reason I say that is because when things are moving and they are going quickly particularly things like wild dogs and various other things and they cross onto the property you can get to them fairly fast and that means that you can generally get to them before the other lodges leave the area if they cross onto our side and, and it means that we can actually continue the sighting so in a way having a smaller area is also sometimes really nice and it also means that you work that area as sort of as well as possible and so you you always kind of know what's around it's very seldom that you're going to have a situation where you're not going to know what tracks are here or what's going on on Juma we typically know roughly which animals would be where and where to find them and so you have a much more intimate knowledge of the area when it's a little bit smaller when it's really vast tracts of land and you can see it in the Mara where you know Brent and, and Jamie and James and Scott and Taylor it's taken them long time to start figuring things out and to figure out exactly where to go to find Find certain things and so it's nice when it's a little smaller in that you can find things a little easier you also get to get to know all the little nooks and crannies and all the little water points and various other little pathways that animals use so it's not the worst thing having a small little section right so we're on the main road and the reason why I'm on the main road is because well I'm just checking around for anything I'm trying to see if maybe Tundi cross south into Chitwa last night. She was obviously last seen coming in this general direction. Her tracks cross onto Torchwood and so I would like to just double check and make sure she didn't cross onto Chitra and is maybe not lying in the Muluwanini somewhere. The Muluwanini ultimately, sorry about the shake on the camera, it's unfortunately a little bit bouncy on this road. The Muluwanini has is, is always been a sort of no-go zone for us whereas now it seems to hold signal quite well and it's a great place for Tandi to go. She often used to spend time when I was at Chitwa that was her main place that she used to be. She used to kind of go into the Muluwanini and lots of sightings of her in there and so it's worth just checking and seeing what's going on on that side of the world. It's also been a bit quiet bird-wise. I thought we might see a few more raptors flying around using thermals, but they seem to be all gone. I don't know, maybe it's just too hot even for the birds to be actively moving. And so hopefully as it starts to cool down, things will get a little bit busier out here. I'm sure Chitra Dam will be busy as well when we head there a little bit later number we're seen is right where we are now just crossing northwards so I wonder 
if maybe he's not still lurking in this general vicinity quite often. Right, I'm going to check for any signs of Tundi or Tumba, the two T's, and while I do that, I believe Brent spotted cats have gotten up and started to moving, which is very exciting. Well, here we go. Uh, mom's up, having a good scan around. Oh, they are just so, so elegant. A little proper teenager, and he's completely flat still. Barely a flick of the tail. There we go. Oh, he flicked his tail. Well done. Oh, his head's up. That's a change. There we go. Now, hopefully, he pulls his back to us. And uh, we'll be able to see that very distinct spot pattern I was talking about right at the base of his tail. And you can see he's a bit older than Malika's boys. You can see he doesn't have that as much of that blonde fluff or, or, or sort of a little mini mane on the back of his neck. Well, Richard's wondering whether these two teachers, cheetahs will share, share the same territory. Well, it's mom and son. So I don't think he's got too much longer, probably not too many more months with his mom before he's gonna have to spark out on his own, lazy boy. Uh, <laughs> But uh, at, for the moment, female cheetahs don't really have territories. They have home ranges, and those home ranges are massive, often much bigger than the males. Uh, only male cheetah are, are really territory, uh, territorial, sorry, really territory. Oof, bad English, very bad English, non-existent, non-existent English. Something popped up behind me. Let me just turn around quickly. Oh, there's something on the ridge. It's a warthog, a very big one, far too big for her. Moonchild is wondering what's the fastest speed a cheetah can get to. Um, they're said to be able to reach 112 kilometers an hour or 70 miles an hour. Uh, and that was very sort of old knowledge. Uh, is we just around 100 i don't think they get as fast as as 110 but um there, there is recording but they say that the in the past the method of recording wasn't as accurate as it is now ah sebastian on the termite mound opposite us there while she's gazing from hers, there's another creature gazing from a termite. Oh, of course it went down the termite mound. But <laughs> no, there goes a fork-tailed drongo, but there was a, 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 a Franklin sitting on, okay, now it's starting to call. Oh, there it is. Oh, there's a superb starling. Off it goes. Must always be careful when you see superb star oh, into the grass. Uh, because as we found out yesterday, it could also be a uh, Hildebrandt's starling. Now, the, this, this spur file, Franklin, that was sitting on top of the uh, termite mound before it disappeared, I'll keep a look out, we might see them again just now, is uh, the Hildebrandt's spur file. Number five, sorry. <laughs> Uh, you do get different color berries, but that was uh, Hildebrand's spur file calling, and we'll hear them calling, I'm sure, uh, very shortly. They're very noisy at dusk and dawn in the Mara. Oh, come on, lady, it's time to go hunting. Head up the hill. Oh, she's definitely far more alert than she was. A bit of a breeze starting now. Hoping that's not going to bring the rain straight to us.
the moment. I'm avoiding the rain, hopefully, by just being in the right place. Jamie, however, hasn't been so lucky, and she's had to put her covers down. Let's go see how she's doing. I'm in the wrong place. I am in absolutely the wrong place. I'm wishing I was down south where I can see it looks lovely. I should be able to see a mountain there. You can kind of, when you look at the edge of the escarpment, you can kind of get an idea of just how heavy that rain is. That's coming to us. That is most definitely coming our way. And if I'm quiet for a moment, you should hear the thunder as well. So we're in trouble. Not in major trouble, but we're in trouble. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to outrun it now, it's too late. So we're looking through the peephole of our, of our rain cover. Ooh. Everybody's raced home. Except for, it's like for us. Oh dear, oh well. There's not much we can do. We're, we're in it now. We've got our covers down. I'm in Scott's car, so it's the one that was the sort of the prototype of the rain covers. So all I can really do is turn our backs to it and we'll just have to weather it. Because <laughs> we're in it now. It's definitely on its way. Well, just the nice thing about these storms, though, is they tend to be quite transient. So I, I reckon we'll be okay in another half an hour or so once it's passed. But I'm going to make my way towards the main road before that happens, just so that in case it really does come down, we're not stuck somewhere here in the mud. Because I was the Angamas, and I know I were somewhere. But I, I've only just recently managed to clean my windscreen. We're going to shelter from the storm and see whether or not I could send our rain across there. Let's go and find out whether Tristan's had any luck with his leopard. Unfortunately not. We found tracks for what looks like Tumba going north into Torchwood, so that doesn't help us much. But I've come to a section of Chitwa which we've never really shown you guys before. I don't think there's ever been a picture of this particular section, and it is a beautiful, beautiful section. It's one of my favorite places, and it's an area that Tundi used to spend a lot of time. So this is the Mulawanini drainage line that runs along Chitwa area, and there's this big rocky outcrop that runs on the western bank of the Mulawanini. It is absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. So you can see there's lots of big rocks, little crevices, and this is why Tundi always used to like to have her cubs in this area. She used to hide them in these little crevices between the rocks, and it was a perfect place to be able to do it. Now that particular tree that is growing out there, is it? No, not that one. Sorry, I thought I saw a rock fig just now, but it's not a rock fig. There's no rock figs that I can see at the moment. They, I thought it was a rock fig, but it's not. Anyway, they, this is an area that where Tundi used to use a lot, and, and I've always wanted to see her spending a lot of time on these rocks. Generally though when I used to find her she used to be down on the sand and I always wanted to see her in the early morning because early morning these rocks glow an orange color. I always wanted to see her on here or a leopard on here so one day I hope it will be and now that we get signal here we can come and obviously check a lot more than what we used to. This is an area that we never used to be able to come and check in and we used to be, have to kind of drive around it and miss it and, and we've had a number of sightings that were in this area that we wouldn't have been able to get to so just wanted to show you guys because it's pretty it's not something we see a lot of on Juma we don't see any rocky sections at all there's very very little of this kind of formation that we see so really nice to have a little bit of it that we can have access to it's not a lot but it is still some and is worth a little bit in its sort of own right and that's why I like coming here and just having a little look around but we are exploring Chitwa as I said earlier we're coming to just see what else is around and 
I don't know, just to see new areas and hopefully you guys will enjoy it as we drive around different areas and explore different places. Chitwa is a, is, a, is a funny place because it's got lots of random sort of vegetation types. You've got this Mulawanini section which has got all these kind of jackalberries and these um, tree wisterias and all kinds of tamburtis and any, everything associated with water. You then climb very quickly away from that and then you get into these ridges that are all sort of crest areas with a lot of marulas and a lot of knob thorns um, and then you go through these massive bush willow and terminalia thickets and so it's just got lots of different kind of patches of things within a small area and so it's quite nice to drive around here because you get a lot of different animals together you get a lot of unique things um, about it and, and, and you often get a lot of kind of cross species here which is quite nice so you'll get you know Nyala impalas zebras buffalo elephants all kind of mixing in an area that is kind of some parts are thick a little bit open so it allows for a bit of everyone to kind of be around which is nice as you just never know what you're going to find which is always exciting Uh, as I go past the lodge here, I want to just double check that there isn't tracks for Tumba maybe coming back because even though he goes into Torchwood a lot, sometimes what he does is he goes in and then he just comes back apparently and comes straight south over the road and the road that he crosses is obviously a very busy road, it's a lot of delivery vehicles, a lot of guests going in and out and so sometimes his tracks can be squished and so you can pick up tracks later if you drive in areas like this and you just drive slowly, sometimes you can just see the footprints coming back into the area and maybe we get lucky and he's still lurking around. It's a perfect place for a leopard, these little drainage sections that I've got on my right hand side are the most wonderful areas to have a look for leopard. Also what I want to do while we're here is just double check on this Gymnogene nest or African Harrier Hawk nest. It's been a long time since we've come past here. I to be honest, I've never actually seen the African Harrier Hawks sitting on the nest itself. I have seen an African Harrier Hawk close to the nest but never on it. But what I do see here instead is some naughty little monkeys. So there's two monkeys that clearly have been up to no good at the lodge. I think they even might have some lodge food in their mouth. The one looks as though it's got something dangling from the mouth and I don't know quite what it is. Maybe it stole a little cookie from afternoon tea as they sometimes do. They are naughty little things and I don't know why they're on their own because both of these are young individuals. They're tiny. They're not very big at all. These are both babies and I don't see any sign of adults but maybe the babies have been naughty and they've gone into the lodge and the adults are still kind of moving around behind us and are still on their way but very cute you see though how the instinct is with with babies as opposed to the adults is they went from a really open tree into quite a thick dense tree where they're going to camouflage a lot better and you can see now they're far more relaxed in there than they were in the open marula they're now trying to find a little place just to kind of sit in the shade where they can watch us from behind these thickets and are far more sort of hidden than they were anywhere else but nice to see little baby monkeys they're always quite cute little things and always up to no good that's for sure now the tree that they're in at the moment, this is the torchwood that has got the gymnogene nest. I will show you the nest now now when I go a little bit further forward, you should be able to see it quite nicely. I'm sure VM will be able to point it out. I don't see any bird on the nest itself. Maybe the gymnogenes have, we found it too late and they had already done their job or maybe the eggs unfortunately got taken by something and they've then abandoned the nest but there is the nest right there it's a pile of sticks in the boughs of a torchwood which is a really good place to have a nest lots of nice sharp thorns on a torchwood difficult to get into and so it is the right kind of area for these guys to be able to build a nest so that's where it kind of is and, and we're going to leave it's there because there really isn't any birds sitting on it at the moment now well, the area that we're in is also quite interesting which I want to show you guys so Sphinx, I didn't catch the question, If Megan if you can just repeat it again for me. Ah, there we go. So Sphinx, you say gymnogenes are your absolute favorite. Well, I think you and some others actually, a lot of people do like the gymnogenes. I, I quite like them too. They're amazing to watch go about their business. I enjoy kind of seeing how they move and how they are able to try and kind of hunt all of these different animals and get all kinds of food from sticking their claws and then their, I mean their talons into holes and grabbing things. Now I'm looking for a specific area here. In fact, here it is right here. And I want to just tell you about a little story that I I have about this particular section. Unfortunately it's changed quite a lot because of this tree falling over but on the left hand side here 
you'll notice that there is a big torchwood that has fallen down. Now, underneath that torchwood, if you look around the general vicinity of that torchwood, you'll notice that the grass is completely bare. It's almost as though there's, that area has been overeaten and eaten a lot more than the other areas around it. If you look in the background, it's long grass. You look to the right, it's long grass, and to the left is quite long grass. Now, the reason why this is like this has got nothing to do with this tree. What happened here was an elephant had died here, a big bull elephant died and it basically its blood and its nutrients and everything leached into the soil and it and the amount of activity that took place here was so much so that it be, actually rendered this area completely barren there was no grass growth there was absolutely nothing it just became one big muddy patch of blood and gore and slowly but surely vultures hyenas lions all kinds of animals were here feeding on it and they basically trampled this place so much so much like an overgrazing effect that it lost the seed layer and nothing then grew and for the first kind of year after that elephant died it was completely bare now we're starting to see vegetation taking place and, and starting to grow again but that is all just because of an elephant carcass that is why it is completely bare here and it doesn't look like the rest of the bush around it it's really quite interesting to watch this elephant carcass has got to be one of the most amazing things that i've experienced just from a behavior point of view of so many different animals the first afternoon that we had this dead elephant here we had about 400 vultures and all the species of vultures that we get here bar the egyptian vulture which is obviously a very very rare individual so we even had cape vultures that arrived here it was a massive problem for about two three days because none of the planes could actually land because the number of circling vultures that were coming down it was really quite insane Subsequent to the vultures arriving, we then had a situation where the hyenas would come in at night and this became an absolute feeding frenzy at night with the hyenas and one night while the hyenas were feeding the Majingalans came in and that was back in the day when the Majingalans used to be the dominant males in this area and they managed to actually kill a hyena here. So we got going in the morning, there was dead elephant, dead hyena, whole bunch of lions that were roaring and carrying on. They then left and then a lion pride came through here, well a coalition of three males and one of those males is still alive, well I think he's still alive in the Kruger. He was part of the um, Salala pa uh, pride and anyway there was one individual that was in really bad shape and fed here for a while and unfortunately also died here so we had a dead elephant a dead hyena and a dead lion all in this particular section hundreds of vultures it was just absolute pandemonium and then coupled with the fact that the dam is close by multitudes of other animals coming past including elephants and watching the elephants reactions to this carcass was such an education we watched multiple herds come past here every single time these elephants came past here the herd would be spread feeding they would all come into a single file it would be absolutely quiet no noise made by the elephants whatsoever and one by one they would file past this individual and they would sniff the carcass even when it was still had meat on it even when the, there was still a lot of vulture and hyena activity they would still come past each one would sniff and for months and months and months afterwards even when there was just bones the same thing would happen it was really quite astonishing to watch the elephants response we used to see also elephants walking from the airstrip side nowhere near this way heading in the complete opposite direction they would catch the scent and they would change the whole herd would change the direction and come and actually investigate here and then go off again it was really quite phenomenal to watch and it was an amazing thing to witness the only problem with this was that it smelt absolutely horrific and for about a month I had to smell this dead elephant smell my room is just was just on the other side of the thicket and this used to just waft towards there every morning I'd open the door and it was just this blanket of dead elephant smell that used to come out but it was an amazing thing to watch an amazing thing to see how nature kind of deals with this and how long it takes for recovery to happen and the fact that there's still bear patch here means that these animals well this area still hasn't recovered from the death of that big animal really quite incredible anyway so that's my story about the elephant carcass and, and its impact on Chitwa's little road and on the edge of its road it was it was really an amazing thing and I was quite fortunate to have witnessed it and to be able to see it every day because sometimes you know elephants die and we see elephants dying but you don't go past it every day and yet this one because it was so close I got to spend a lot of time coming past every single day enjoy like just to watch and to watch this process of decomposition and to see how it all worked was just absolutely phenomenal now Jenny animation and many others you say absolutely wow that's an amazing story well it is an incredible thing and I, I'll never forget it because it was just the most amazing sort of scenario now Viem while I'm sitting talking and sort of mouthing off over here VM has spotted what we're looking for in terms of leopard tracks so VM I'm gonna try position the car that you can show me on the screen and then I'll be able to just talk about what leopard tracks we've got maybe I'll even get out let in fact let's get out and let's go and have a little leopard track lesson 
Now, I believe the Mara is also having a few gremlin issues, so you guys are going to be stuck with me for a while. So we will do some tracking lessons. Now, VM, I'm going to go around this way, which is a long way around. I do apologize. I'm going to go through all the bushes. I don't want to go behind the car because otherwise VM is not going to be able to see me. But there we go. We're now down. So VM, where have you seen these tracks? Ah, there we go. Now, these are the tracks that VM is talking about. I'm going to just circle this whole section over here. Now, there's a track over there. A track over here and then another track two tracks over here but we'll deal with this one because this is the most contrasted and probably the easiest one to tell and to be able to show you that this is a leopard now when we see tracks and we're driving around obviously hyena tracks are very similar and ones that look really quite the same and it's sometimes quite tough from a vehicle to see but what you need to look for the, the most immediate thing is that you can see that these tracks all point in a very straight line so each track follows pretty much straight on the other one and they don't push out like this this morning we saw hyena tracks and they were out and they were very kind of duck footed if you want to call it that. The other thing that we've got is we've got at the back here we've got one, two, three lobes which we do not see on a hyena track, we'll only see two. There's also nice evenly spaced toes and no claws on the front end there. Now in terms of what and which, if it's male or female, this particular track would be from a male. If you look at how wide the track is, I'll use my finger, it's about my index finger wide and if I put my finger the same way, it's about the same long. So this little track is very round, which is typical of the males. All right, the males have very rounded tracks, whereas the females will have a track that's slightly more oval shaped than this. So, male leopard, but it seems as though a number of vehicles have driven over it and it's crossed over here. I can see its tracks going into this area. So we're going to just follow it anyway, just for the sake of following and seeing. Maybe we get lucky. Maybe we have some sort of luck for it. It looks like a youngish male, so I would imagine for Tumba, but it's worth checking. It's worth having a little look around. You never know. Maybe we get fortunate and we can find this individual somewhere in this general vicinity. It doesn't look as though they're from this afternoon, but it looks as though maybe from last night. Exciting times. Be nice to catch up with Tumba, I think. Well, I would like to catch up with Tumba. Let me plug myself in so Megan can talk to me. There we go. Now we're all plugged in, back and ready to go. And let's see if we can keep up with these tracks and just see where they head off to. They do head in behind the hangar. And for some reason, leopards like to hang around this structure. Ever since I was working at Chitra, all the leopards, in Tima, Safari, um, Mafufunyan, Karula, Tandi, Kuchava, Hosana, Tamba, Wabayiza, every single one of them I've seen at this little hangar and behind it there's a little quarry there and they all seem to go in there i don't know why it is it just seems to be where they like to head off to and so we'll just go check around there and maybe we'll get lucky ourselves now this road always reminds me of the 2012 floods so while we're kind of getting around to where that quarry is i'll always remember this road from the 2012 floods because this road was absolutely destroyed completely destroyed you could not drive a vehicle through here at all everything was washed away it was in very bad shape you can see now it's a lovely beautiful smooth road and that was because charles who who owns chitwa chitwa who's an incredibly hard-working individual got us out here and we had to fix this entire road so what you'll see is that there are these big bolsters bumps are big concrete pipes actually and those concrete pipes able to get the water to flow from the seep line which is on our right hand side down through and into the bush areas on the left hand side so it was a long process of spending a lot of time out in the sun with a TLB and some spades and we dug all of these pipes smoothed this whole road out and we did it in about the space of three days and eventually we got the road completely smooth that even a sedan car could come through there so it was quite an effort to do and I had tick bite fever at the time so it was a bit of a rough couple days it was wasn't exactly pleasant but it was at least something that we achieved and even now when I drive down that road it makes me think of those that particular period which I can tell you was a tough period to be here we really it was not easy there was a lot of work that had to be done to repair all of those roads it looked completely different to what you see now the bush did not look at the same at all this was incredibly dense incredibly thick Chitra Dam was even overflowing over that wall now we all know how big that wall is at Chitra Dam and later when I go there I'll show you but the water was about knee-high going over that dam and pushing into 
um, the riverbed below and it actually almost washed away little Gauri camp it was very close to that it cut and eroded the whole bank and the deck washed away and it was all because Chitra Dam was overflowing and if Chitra Dam wall had burst you probably would have found that that camp would have been gone the camp below that the vessels camp would have been gone and then that would have gone all the way down towards Mala Mala and probably could have even caused Mala Mala to flood so it was a dire situation we had to pack sandbags and all kinds of other things it really was quite something I'll never forget sitting in the middle of the night it was about 11 o'clock at night in the complete darkness with a headlamp and a cell phone torch that was all we had and we were trying to pack sandbags in about knee-deep water that was gushing over the Chitwa Dam wall and we all know that Vlad and Boris were around at the time and so you get these catfish hit bumping into your legs every now and then it was uh, not a pleasant experience I'll tell you that much but it had to be done and so we ended up doing it and that was the end of that and, and we managed to get it all fixed and sorted and the next morning kind of take toll of what happened and, and then get it, everything done so it was a <laughs> it was a tough time the 2012 floods I, like I say it was it was just amazing how much water came down and how we ended up really battling James you say chit with tails should be a regular thing but it's fascinating well I'm glad you enjoy it James it's, it's just a bit of history from from a very small section of its of Chitwa's history in, in general and there was a lot of things that happened and I had a really had a great time when I was at Chitwa I made a lot of good friends and really kind of established my guiding career here in terms of kind of getting really into it and, and starting to learn a lot and so it was a good place to be in and, and I really didn't enjoyed it and had lots of fun times and so there are quite a few stories definitely some of them are fairly above board and others not so much and so <laughs> we have a few like the fixing of a dam wall that's probably if my mother knew about them which she's probably is going to watch this and will comment on it later but she'll probably kill me if she knew I was doing those things at the time but it's too late now I've already done it and I've survived so it's all good now this road that we're driving on now runs parallel to the airstrip so the airstrip is on my western side at the moment and it's a road that I drive every now and then when I used to work at Chitra and it's actually quite a productive road there's sometimes quite a lot on it because the animals use the shelter and shade of the area sort of towards well, on the edge of the runway and then they can often hunt from it or go out and graze a little bit later in the day so it's a nice area just to check also beautiful scenery here we've got lots of massive torchwoods in this area and torchwoods are some of the most beautiful trees they got these kind of tall stems gnarled bark and these big big green canopies and it's not a tree we see a lot on on Juma obviously we've got that beautiful prominent torchwood that is around sort of um, Zoe's and and impala plains in that area but other than that very few of them that are really prominent big nice looking torchwoods whereas here on Chitwa there's some of my most favorite torchwoods are in this area so it's always nice to drive around here even if I don't see anything it's just pretty and it's and like I say different environment to what we drive on Juma you can also see a lot denser than what you see on Juma it, it tends to get a lot thicker here and that's partially why Chitwa is quite tough to find animals in the summer in the winter you'd see quite a lot here but in the summer a little tough um, just because of how dense it is it's it's a difficult area to spot things in the summer but if you work hard and you track here you can often be rewarded with some very special sightings so nice to be back in in these areas and it's funny to think that we we're talking about Mvula earlier and this area that we're in now was Mvula's home this is where we used to see him often I used to find him on all of these roads around here regularly and um, it's strange now to think that he very he seldom if ever comes down this way and spends time here it's, it's weird to think that you can't you know there's no chance of really bumping into him when you drive around here it's now all Tingana's area and this is where he likes to hang around the other leopard we used to see here which is one that maybe some of you probably won't be familiar with was a female by the name of ostrich copies now ostrich copies um, is the lineage of intima so the same same kind of lineage as that I think she was also known as Campbell copies or intima was known as Campbell copies I don't know one of the two but ostrich copies was also a beautiful theme we used to see every now and then on this particular section where we are now she used to come up from a net and then into this area and then back to to Mala Mala so she was also a very cool leopard had some great sightings of her in fact this tree that's coming up now which is actually a tree we don't see much either on Juma it's a, called a long-tailed cassia and the long-tailed cassias are beautiful beautiful flowering plants they get a bright yellow flower 
It's this on the right hand side. Uh, let me just go forward for VM and you can see it's got quite an interesting kind of shape a very dark wooded tree so the bark is very dark in comparison to some of the other trees that we see out here and then it's got these leaves that almost hang down they look as though they're wilting in the in the sort of heat but they just hang like that that's typical even if it's raining or if it's not that's what it looks like and I remember ostrich copies twice seeing her on this particular tree with a kill so she used to hang the killed twice in there and, and used to sit here and used to find her in this tree quite often and it's actually quite a nice tree to see a leopard in it's a very contrasty tree so when a leopard lies in that their golden coat against that dark kind of bark is often very pretty so it's a nice tree to see there's no pods on it at the moment that give it oh they are actually i think in the far no they're not sorry those are just branches i thought maybe there were some pods in the far left and the reason it gets this long-tailed cassia name is basically it's got this massive long seed pod that's about that long and it hangs off the tree and it almost looks like little monkey's tails that are hanging off and that's where it's got its name it's you previous name or the name that we used to use here colloquially in South Africa was the Shambok pod and the Shambok pod and the reason it was called that a Shambok it was a basically a shortened leather whip so it was a very small piece of leather that people used to beat other people with effectively and it, it wasn't very correct to carry on calling it that and that's why the name changed to long-tailed cassia and if you're interested in what the scientific name is it's cassia abbreviata if you would like to go and read up a little bit more about them that's the kind of name of the tree Oh, long time since I've looked at that tree. <laughs> Crispy, wondering what wildlife is most abundant out here. Well, at Chitwa, I think probably the most abundant species, uh, plant life, plant and tree life. Mm, I would say hands down the bush willows. If you look around us, all these small trees that you're seeing are all bush willows. So bush willow really has taken over. Red and russet, the two of them. There's also a couple large fruited and variable bush willows in amongst them, but bush willows is predominantly what we see here. Quite a few torchwoods, quite a few cassias, uh, marulas, there's not too many leadwoods, very few jackalberries in this area. This is now we're right up on a crest and so not enough water for the slower growing trees like the jackalberries and the like. So this is all going to be kind of crest areas and, and the bush willows make up most of that. There's another beautiful torchwood on my left hand side. They all dotted all over the place and you can see why I like them. They've got this beautiful bark. If maybe if I just go forward for VM, it'll help a bit. But it's kind of a gnarled sort of trunk and it's got lots of different shapes and no single torchwood looks the same. Some of them are really grooved and gnarled like that. Others are a little bit smoother, but they really do have these beautiful straight trunks and then this massive crown that comes out. So they always a very nicely shaped tree and you can see they stand way above the bush willows at the moment and any of the other trees really. There's only a couple knob thorns and marulas that rival these torchwoods in this particular section. It's a wonderful place just to drive around and have a look. Now what I think we're going to do is we're going to probably head from here I'm going to get to towards Cheetah Plains driveway and then from Cheetah Plains driveway I want to come across the Annette Chitwa boundary and the reason why I want to do that is just in case maybe Kuchava is around so this is an area that nowadays is Kuchava this is where she hangs around quite a bit and so it's worthwhile just having a look I know she was seen at Cheetah Plains camp um, I think it was yesterday or the day before somewhere there she was seen also Tingana was seen on Cheetah Plains yesterday so I'm gonna try and just have a look maybe one of the two of them comes out onto this area it's a worthwhile place to have a little check around and ultimately like I say it's a, it's a new adventure for a lot of us because these areas that we're seeing now are areas that we never used down this road because this is going to take us to the boundary let's go up to and Bugalutu Junction now those two names of Fuganyao means to take a walk and see nothing and you can see it's thick
break up in picture because of where I was heading. Now I'm not sure if it's going to hold, so I'm actually going to head back towards the dam. I was going to go in its cut line, but if we're going to battle to keep reception, then I'm going to start heading backward. But I was talking about the name of the road. So one, like I was saying, is called Faganyao, which runs from the driveway to Cheetah Plains. And the reason why that was called Faganyao is because there used to be a number of staff members who used to have girlfriends at Cheetah Plains, and they used to take that road and walk there on the sly to go and visit friends and the same from the Cheetah Plains guys coming to visit their girlfriends at Chitwa and so that's where it got its name and then the other road is called Bugalutu now Bugalutu means to see nothing and it's because of the density of the vegetation here I can tell you in 2012 if you found a leopard here or any sort of cat you was absolutely no way that you were going to follow it through any of this area I remember once trying to follow a cheetah female through this and we got all of about five meters and had to stop and turn around because it was just a wall of vegetation and so that's why that road got its name it's just because of how dense and thick it is in these areas and you can see why it's a great place for a leopard The leopards absolutely love it That's why Tundi always spends so much time around here is because she just had the best places to hunt She used to roam around in these thickets and hunt many a diker and Steenbok and various other small little creatures Scrub hares were also high up on the menu So she spent a lot of time going after quite a few different small mammals here So what I think I'm gonna do is like I say is rather head to the airstrip from the airstrip let's go round down towards the dam maybe we get lucky maybe we don't it's just checking there's some hyena tracks there's not leopard no those are not leopard tracks no hyena tracks so just checking around and scanning some of the termite mounds if there is a leopard around I think now's the time where it's starting to really cool off the temperature is dropping quickly now it's now starting to get quite pleasant out here in comparison to what we started with this afternoon so it's apparently 99 and 37 currently, which it actually feels a lot cooler. There seems to be a bit of a breeze that's come up now. It's also the sun has lost that bite. The sun often is very, very, very strong out here in the middle parts of the day. And now it's lost that little sort of hint of, of burning and it's, it's far more pleasant than it was. Now Scottish, I'm going to get to your question now, but there is a bird here that's just stopped. There it is, Vim, you see it's just on top there, of uh, the small, small tree behind the marula. The small marula, just towards the top right of that small marula. Now oh, there it goes up into the big marula. There we go. So there's a, a b little bird, a tiny bird, which is giving Vim the run around. So on the left side of the marula, underneath that main branch, Vim, you see it's midway along that main branch that goes to the left. Small little, so it's a little chin spot bat. Is if you go straight in on your frame now, you sh so this branch is there. So. Okay, I can move now. So VM's battling a little bit with the car being where it is because of the the way that the light is. Um, VM, let me go back for you. So this is all quite a lot of work for a chin spot batters, but why not? It, oh no, it's flown. Have you got it? Yeah. So VM has got it, I think. Let's see, VM's going to go in on it. It's a beautiful small bird and it's got a funny call. It sings the three blind mice rhyme. So it's always singing along and there it is. You can see why it's called a chin spot battus. It's got that rusty little chin underneath the beak and then that big rusty bar over the chest area. And so these chin spot battuses are very common in this area. We see a lot of them and they are difficult to get on camera because they're small flighty little birds and they're often sort of hopping from branch to branch and don't sit still for very long at all. And they are big insect eaters. You can see, look at all those pectoral sort of growths or little hairs that are around the beak much like a nightjar you find a lot of your insect eaters have those pectoral hairs around that beak and are able then to help them with catching insects and sensing insects as they close their eyes when they're grabbing to stop the eyes being injured so very common to see on a lot of your insect eaters and this little guy's being quite obliging to sit for as long as he has very cool that's nice I like it. Right, now back to the upside down tree question and, and where they are and what they are called. So the upside down tree is called a baobab. That is the name of an upside down tree, it's a baobab. And it's a fun name to say, I always think it's fun to say, but anyway. The baobabs, unfortunately, none of them are here. We don't see baobabs. In fact, I can show you a baobab, but 
I'll try and let's see if I can actually see it from where we're going to go now because there is one baobab that I know of in this area. It is not a baobab that is growing naturally. It was planted at Chitwa Lodge and so I'll try and see if we can see it and spot it. I'll head in that direction now. Um, but otherwise, no, they occur a little bit further north of us. Um, they often are in areas a little bit drier than where we are now. Also a different substrate of soil and so we don't see very many of them at all. You get a lot though once you go from South Africa towards Zimbabwe into Botswana and then from there northwards there are even lots in Kenya but just more towards the sort of eastern side not exactly where the Mara is you see a lot more towards Savo and Mombasa and that side lots of big 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 baobabs in that area so do get them in a lot of parts of Africa just unfortunately not where we are now by the looks of it this road hasn't been driven in about 10 weeks because the amount of tracks on this road is difficult to discern one from another. Also there is absolutely no evidence of a vehicle track since the rain that we had so I don't think this road has been driven in quite some time and often driving a road that's not been explored is a good thing because sometimes you get lucky and you can find what you're looking for and a little pot of gold but alas I don't think we're gonna find anything because we're back to where we started and we're going to head towards the airstrip now and then on to towards Chitwa Dam after that and hopefully there'll be something lurking in those areas and maybe we can even get a glimpse of the baobab tree that I was talking about Maybe one day I'll ask Charles nicely if we can go in towards the Baobab and we can do a whole segment on the Baobab because it's right in the lodge, close to the entrance of the lodge. And so it's, uh, it's the only place that we would be able to find it, unfortunately, in this area. But alas, I think our signal is going to be our enemy in terms of tracking this leopard track. It does go towards where we lost signal, so unfortunately I don't know if we're going to get lucky, but we'll try. We'll, like I say, just keep roaming around and see. Maybe this leopard pops out somewhere around. Yeah, I think it's the same tracks VM that we saw a little bit earlier. I think it's the same. So VM and I saw tracks earlier cutting into Torchwood and I wonder if this, because I see a lot of footprints here of them, somebody tracking this animal. So I think it went round all the way up Chitwa driveway and then onto Gauri Main and then turned from there. It looks like a similar age of the track and you can see the vehicles have gone over it. So I don't know if these are too fresh, but I believe a lot of you are rooting for us in finding some sort of animal this afternoon. And so hopefully we will. I've still enjoyed myself and hopefully you guys have too. I, I know we haven't seen too much and we haven't seen seen too many birds but we've had lots of fun stories and talked about a lot of different things and so hopefully you've all enjoyed it as well. Right now we're approaching towards Chitwa. I wonder if I can get a glimpse of a baobab from here. I've actually never checked to be honest and the baobab is growing so at some point oh there's an animal it's got a heartbeat. Hello impalas they all look very relaxed at the moment so they're all super chilled and taking it very easy lots of females Although they don't look as heavily pregnant as I thought they would by now. They do look very good in this late afternoon sun, but not nearly as pregnant as I was hoping some of them would be. they definitely developing, but it seems as though we're going to have a late lambing season this year, as opposed to an early one. There's a female that's quite round. She's got a little bit of a belly going on her. So she's developed quite nicely, I suppose, of all the others. There's one or two. There's the other one now coming from the right is also quite heavily pregnant as well. So there seems to be a couple of them that are getting close now. It's going to be cool to see when we get all the lambs. I love the lambing season. It's, it's a time of plenty in many ways, not only from a predator point of view, but just for our point of view and being able to watch what goes on and see these little lambs. And maybe sometimes we even get lucky and get to witness a birth. So nice to, to have that situation. <coughs> Excuse me. I just need to cough a bit. Now I'm just going to wave to my friends over here. I haven't seen them for a long time. These are guys that I worked with, so it's always good just to wave to them and say hello. Right, now, I don't think we're going to be able to see our baobab. It's straight down this road, so if you had to kind of drive straight down the road, then it just goes round a little bit to the left, and then right there is where the baobab is. So we're not going to be able to see it, unfortunately, but I am going to start carrying, well, start checking the southern side of Chitwe and then towards the dam. And while I do that, I believe Jamie has got some signal back, and while she's sitting in a rather makeshift tent trying to shelter from the storm. We survived. We survived the rain, sort of. Um, I'm I'm pretty damp, actually. The water's all come in from the front, and in fact, I'm just gonna 
whack that over my monitor again. So we've survived and the rain is very heavy still up at camp. Oh, the lightning is really bad, but we're just slowly but surely making our way towards home. So essentially what we'll do is we will stay out. Unfortunately, there's no roads that are open anymore uh, apart from the main road. So what we'll do is we will be staying out, but we'll be chatting basically inside our tent unless things clear up a little bit. The, the skies to the south are completely clear, but unfortunately the storm is coming from the north and the east. So the skies that way are beautiful. The skies this way are very, very intimidating and the storm is continuing to make its approach in this area. I managed to get, I had to get out of where we were, so, which meant I had to drive, which is why we sprung a few leaks. But I had to get out of there because the rain was going to be, make that road undrivable very soon. So we had to get onto the main road. So what you can do is send through questions on birds. Let's chat a little bit about birds. I've already mentioned that I'm going, I don't think I can drive any further forward in this. Um, I've already mentioned that I'm going to Uganda to go and see the shubles. So we'll show you a picture of a shubal when I've got a place that I can turn around. I do want to turn around so I can put my more secure side to the wind. Oh, sludgy, 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 sludgy. So, oh. Okay. I wouldn't have caused that. I wouldn't have called that the most controlled descent, but it, it was sort of controlled. I really wish I was over there, where it was nice and not stormy. You can't really see that, can you? This, by the way, in the windscreen, I discovered what happened over there. That was um, Scott who decided somehow it was a good idea to, for him to put his mattress on the windscreen, and it's it's cracked all the way along. <laughs> <laughs> discovered the actual story behind that. I'm not sure how he ever thought that was a good idea. There's also a puddle at my feet. It's very cold. <laughs> it's very cold and very uncomfortable. Right, so I was going to show you a picture of a shubal so that you can have a look. Oh, you know what I did? I got a little bit from that I got a little bit of that question, Meg, sorry, I got it from Take Care. I actually forgot to do this yesterday and it slipped out of my mind completely. This is Brent's favorite bird and he asked me to play the call and I completely forgot to play the call of the great blue Taraka. Remember we were talking about favorite birds? There we go, that's the one that Brent mentioned and he asked me to play the call and I never did, so I might as well do it now. I wonder if there's more to it. That's a very cool call. Cool. You get the idea. So I promised I'd do that yesterday, and I never really had the opportunity. Megs, you want to try again with that question? It was about birds' eyesights, but I couldn't hear exactly what it was. There we go, that. that's the shubal. Take care while we look at the shubal. I spoke about the fact that an eagle or most birds actually have exceptional eyesight. And you want to know why or if an eagle's eyesight is better in flight or when it's still. But just quickly, this is the shubal that we're going to go and see in Uganda. Look at that. There have been three random sightings where we are in the Mara three completely unexpected sightings and they were from the same bird in 94 and 95. Now, I don't think it's likely we're going to see a shubal here but can you imagine if we added a shubal to our list? Right so take care the animal I think it's safe to say that the eagle's eyesight is just as good whether it's flying or sitting still. I suppose it's easier for us to, it to focus on things if it's sitting still on a branch. I guess that might make sense because it's you know it's like us sitting and looking at things rather than trying to observe and it might have less, less to do with its eyesight and more to do with the analysis of its brain. So if you sit in a room and you look around you, you're going to notice more than if you walk through a room. Surely? 
So I guess in a way he's sitting still, but I think its eyesight's much of a muchness. And birds have really, really good eyesight. They almost, in the way, in, in sort of a, a human way of understanding it, they almost see things moving in slow motion because they see at a higher frame rate. And they've also got the ability to see, to zoom in, essentially. So they've almost got binocular vision. Their eyes are completely different to the way that ours are adapted. I'm sorry, I realized I forgot to do something. I need to do a literal reading of the Great Blue Taraka's call. As something I've been doing, and I've neglected while I've been in the Mara, but I've been doing it. <laughs> Sorry. I have to laugh at this. So this is, this is, all bird books have a written version of the call. And sometimes they're quite hilarious. And in this case, this one's proved to be quite hilarious. This one apparently goes gonk 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 <laughs> which builds to a crescendo with a rolling pru call <laughs> gonk 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 there you go a literal reading of the great taraka call this is why i started this whole thing i'm not i'm not in any way being insulting to the various twitches and ornithologists that have actually um that have <laughs> put together these bird books, but it's kind of hilarious. Oh, this one doesn't have one. The shubal doesn't have one. Sounds like a pig. And a donkey. I'm not sure they didn't just record this at a farmyard and pretend it was a shubal call. That's what it sounds like to me. I'll let you know. I'll let you know when we go. We're going over. We're going to Entebbe. So we're going to be around here. Oh, no, don't start again. We can do without the without the um, farmyard animals. So we're going to Entebbe. Then we're going to Kampala. And then we're meeting up with Craig, actually, and Rebecca and Ginger. And we're going white water rafting down the Nile. And then we're going to stay on the island with the best name in the entire world. It's called Hairy Lemon Island. Don't ask me. I, I don't know what it is about it. I don't know if they are, if they have some kind of fruit that, that's furry and maybe that's why they have it Hairy Lemon. I don't know. But anyway, and I'm, I'm basically just sitting here gabbling because there's nothing else I can do until this rain settles ever so slightly and then we'll be able to film out of our little windows on the side. Roshni, I will tell you what fascinates me so much about Shubles. Just, just let me tell you this tale. I can't believe you haven't heard this tale before. Um, the, the, the fascination with Shubles, first of all, it's because you actually are uh, just traveling outside of my sphere to go and see one, and I have to. Whereas m a lot of other birds in, in Africa, you, there's a bit of a crossover and you can see them. But in, in the case of Shubles, you actually really have to make a, a determined trip. They're massive. They're weird looking. They look like they've got a clog on the end of their noses, on their faces. But what actually caused the fascination was when I was at university in my third year. When was it? I saw something with a documentary and it, uh, the shoebills featured in it. And there was a, an image of the shoebill tilting its head in the, that curious way that birds do. But it looks so peculiar because of their bizarre faces. And just by the way, our host in Entebbe told us that they are awesomely ugly. Um, that that night, because I was busy with studying for exams and I was absolutely exhausted, I had a stress dream where it was a it was a sort of an 80s style shubel with psychedelic um, tie dye colors weaving around it. It's one of the weirdest dreams I've ever had. And it was dispensing life advice in the form of, uh, I don't know if you get those Hewlett's little, little messages on the backs of your Hewlett sugar packets. I don't know if you get those. But um, essentially, it was it was dispensing this ridiculously patronizing what's, platitude it, in little bursts, and they were coming out of its mouth in speech bubbles. It was the strangest dream I've ever had, and I put it down to stress because I was writing my worst subject that next day, and I still to this, this day don't know what that was about. That was right. It was also um, it was equity law. And equity has all of these little maxims that you can apply. Equity, uh, the law does not assist the volunteer and so on. And that was what he was saying as well. It was definitely a he. 
I bet that's not the explanation you were expecting to get for my fascination with shoebills. It's true, though. It's 100% true, and I've been dying to see a shoebill ever since. And I've never had the opportunity, but now I'm right next door to Uganda. Okay, we're going to settle, I think, for a little bit longer with our covers down. I think the worst of it has passed. Let's go across to Tristan, who's got his far lookers out to have eyesight almost as good as a bird's. Well, the reason why I have my binoculars out is because we are trying to scan around to see if we can get any view of Fasana whatsoever. So he's not far from where we are now. He's still inside Little Gauri on the Little Gauri Vessels cut line, but it is straight down the road that we're sitting next to. And that road leads to an area that has got a little mud wallow and he's lying at the mud wallow. So I was just taking an off chance to see if maybe I could spot him with my binoculars. But alas, I think he's unfortunately completely hidden at this stage. And they say that he's sleeping. He had a meal this morning. He killed a little bit. Baby Diker, and, and so I don't think he's going to go too far. What we're going to do is just go to the dam though and listen out in case he does start moving. Maybe he will come down this road. It's, I would say, probably maybe 400 meters down the road itself. You can see the road kind of leads and drifts, and so there's a little dip there, a drainage section, and then it goes on. And just where you see a bit of grass cutting and then the road continuing, just off that grass cut there on the left is where the mud wallow is. And so he's lying up just on that side of it, on the southern side of the road, so we can't see it. But there is a beautiful scotia with a sunset as well, so a boar bean that is not flowering at the moment, unfortunately. I was hoping it would. Unfortunately, this boar bean's had a tough, day, a tough time of it. It's and been struck by lightning once or twice and a number of issues with its um, with its bark being pulled off and all kinds of things so it's had a bit of a rough life but it's still an incredible specimen nonetheless there's a couple of nyala that are also in front meandering across the road and so they're kind of drifting towards Chitwa Dam maybe we'll catch up with them on that side hopefully we'll see a situation with Hosanna following them and coming down this way and maybe he ends up coming onto Chitra. It's worth just sticking around for a bit. Like I say, go and sit at the dam and enjoy the sunset around the dam. Have you seen something, Wildy? The dead knobthorn behind us is an eagle apparently, so let's see what that is. Hold on, Wildy, there's a road that goes there so we can get a little closer. Don't worry. Oh, there we go. That's going to be... So there's a Wahlberg's eagle, I think. Let's have a look and just double check. Yes, looks like a Wahlberg's, a dark form Wahlberg's eagle. You've got to be a little careful and double check at this time of the year because sometimes you do get the lesser spotted, as Brent was mentioning this morning, and you've got to just double check. But that's, I'm 100% sure, a Wahlberg's eagle that's sitting there. It would explain why the squirrel was complaining and going crazy and why there's a couple of Franklins that have also made some noise. Now, I'm interested to see if this Wahlberg's eagle, I would imagine this is where it's going to perch for the night. I don't think there's going to be too much flying. That sun is going down quite steadily, and so it would be maybe another 20 minutes of light. So maybe this is where this Wahlberg's is settling for the night. Interestingly enough though, there's no nest that I know of on Chitwa for the Wahlberg's eagles. There could obviously be one being built, but I do not know of any nest for them. What I do know that there is, and I'll show you now, is a nest for a vulture, and, and the vulture maybe has left, and that's maybe where this Wahlberg's is now starting to nest. In fact, that nest is gone completely. It's been a long time since I've checked, but that knob thorn over there housed a vulture nest for many, many, many years. So this one that grows over there, no, to the left of that one, sorry, Vildi, and there at the back, yeah, that one. So that one there housed a vulture nest for many years, and I don't know what's happened to it. It was still there. there. Actually, there it is. It's right on the top right corner there. Right, there it is. So I think that's it conglomeration of sticks that forms a bit of a nest looks a bit patchy doesn't it maybe I'm wrong but that was where the nest was and there was a number of chicks that were raised in that nest I saw lots and lots of different ones and actually that nest happened because of a elephant carcass that was here it was an elephant that unfortunately died due to illness and um, there was a number of vultures and it was just about the time when it was breeding what are you doing with all the big boys, little one? So there's a little nyala in the green grass. How nice is that contrasting color with the rufus of the nyala and the bright green grass? 
Looks really good, and there's what they will turn into one day if it's a little male. Here's a massive big male Nyala. So I'm not sure what it's doing in amongst all these males. There's, I can count one, two, three, four, five different male Nyala here with this little one and just one female. So I wonder if that female's not coming into estrus, and that's why a number of the males are starting to give her attention, and this little one is her previous baby. Often what you'll find with Nyala is if they do go into an estrus cycle, and they mate, they will fall pregnant, and when they give birth, the older um, calf will stay with them for a little, or foal should we say, should stay with, will stay with them for a, a little bit longer, and we'll have a situation where it will stay until the next one is born. So you generally get a two-year-old, and then when that two-year-old, well, the next one is born, the two-year-old then leaves and goes off. So this will just be, stay with its mom still for another generation. But how amazing is it to see the difference between these two animals? You see the male on the left, who's completely dark and brown, and then the female on the right, who's more that rusty color. She's also struggling with a bit of mange. And this male Nyala we've actually seen before, too, the one on the left. You see the mange there on the neck. So it's not just the lions that struggle with it, sometimes the antelope. But now with green, green leaves and good diet and a bit of rain, that should go away quite quickly. But the male one, if you have a look on his right hip, I saw him the other day. I I think on Juma even it might have been. He's got that scrape mark on his right hip. We have seen him before, definitely. I recognize that scar. And it will be interesting if we do see him again, how far he ranges. But I'm pretty sure I saw that individual in the Mulawati somewhere. I not, I mean, could be wrong, of course, but that's where I think it is. Now there's going to be two Nyala that are going to cross the road in front of us. So we're going to be gentlemanly and let our male counterparts cross in front of us. Rita, you say you love how they walk. It is very cool, isn't it? And the reason why they walk that way is all very delicate and very kind of gingerly. And then they place their one foot in front of their other foot slowly. And they always will direct register. So you'll find the back foot goes exactly where the front foot is, just to make sure that they're not making too much noise and attracting too much attention to themselves. So in case there's a predator around and these thickets don't hear them, and they can then get and sneak around without being seen or heard. Now I want to just reverse a little bit because I remembered that there's actually quite a special plant here that we don't see very much in on Juma and I just got a I know it's here very close I just can't remember exactly where I think it's just behind me here I don't I hope it hasn't been squashed or been pushed over by Ellie's in last year's drought maybe I've gone past it already oh it's gone used to be somewhere here I'm just trying to see now it was just on the left hand side of the road and it maybe it's gone unfortunately but it was a sandpaper raisin that we had here and it's a very cool tree because it's got leaves that are very rough much like sandpaper and you it's amazing actually I used to come here on my bushwalks and at that stage obviously carried a rifle and you used to take the rifle and you could actually buff the wood of the rifle using this um, leaf and unfortunately it looks as though the tree is no longer there anymore I suppose that was four years ago and so the Ailes could have easily pushed it during that drought and, and unfortunately destroyed it. Raisin trees do often get obliterated by elephants. Now we're going to try and sneak past our little male Nyala without giving him too much problems. Sorry little one. Hello, you asking do we see any violets or flowering orchids here in the Sabi sands? Well, yes, we do get what's called an African violet, and they haven't come out just yet. I have been looking for them. They haven't been appearing just yet. I'm sure we will see them in the near future. We will start to see these little African violets coming out. And then, also, the orchids that you're asking, we do get an orchid here called a leopard orchid. And I did see it this morning, and where we're going, there is one, so I will show you one just now. If you just stick with us, we will get to it fairly shortly. Right, let's leave our little Nyalas alone. Thank you, Nyalas. That was very pretty and very nice. Um, I'm super bleak about my sandpaper raisin because that was such an epic tree. Oh, well, I suppose these things happen. You can't expect trees to last forever, particularly through droughts. Now, I do apologize if there's a bit of breakup. This is an ultimate test of the signal at Chitwe. We never used to get signal here, so if it breaks up, I apologize. I'm going to do a quick little loop around and through, and hopefully you're still with me. Hopefully, 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 and up the other side. How did we do, Megan? Hopefully Megan's still with us. I haven't heard anything, which is no news is good news, as they say.
Ah, excellent. That's amazing and very good news because lots happens in this little drainage. And so if we've got signal there, that's very exciting. Now we're going to get an absolutely spectacular sunset from Chitwood Dam, so I want to try and get around. Umka, you're asking with all the talk of trees and plants, would there be any specific trees that attract lightning? No, no specific trees. Obviously, a standalone tree on an open clearing is always a prime target. Any of these big trees on the crests that are quite high up, they t sometimes get hit. So, you find a lot of the dead trees, though, tend to get hit a lot more. And um, so, a lot of these big ones that we see here have been hit by lightning. In fact, there's one right there. You can see the branch was hit and that branch fell off. So, that gives you an idea of some of the types of trees that will be hit. So, right out in the open on a crest is the perfect place and you can actually see the branch that's lying sort of horizontally over the termite mound where it actually struck and eventually then rotted off and fell down so it's quite common to see trees being struck by lightning out here it's it's not uncommon in multiple different species i've seen leadwood knobthorn marulas torchwoods um terminalias bush willows so really quite a different a lot of different species so there's no one tree in particular that will get struck and will end up being um, hit by lightning. Now I don't know if a lot of you remember the story of the black mamba, tandy tamba and the brown snake eagle but if you have heard of that story or you've seen any video of that story we are about to go right past where it happened. It happened right here on the right hand side and this is where unfortunately that brown snake eagle had a really rough day and it got hit not only by a mamba but by two leopards too and the worst part about that whole story is I came here in the afternoon after that incident and that poor brown snake eagle was still alive completely incapacitated struggling to breathe from the venom it was really a horrible thing to see and I actually didn't stay long but I believe the next morning it was gone so I think hopefully something like a hyena maybe came out and put it out of its misery and, and took it away maybe even Tandy herself took it but it was not a very nice thing to see amazing sighting in just the, the sort of interaction between two leopards a black mamba and a, and a big bird of prey but not very pleasant to see that bird of prey suffering and lying there just kind of struggling to breathe and really not being able to move it was a bit of a horrible thing to witness but I suppose that's nature and it's the way it goes unfortunately you often get these situations where there's some things that are hard to witness right down to Chitwa Dam we go the good news also is I heard that there's some elephants on a net which is just south of Chitwa so hopefully that's the start of them coming back into our area and us starting to see a few of the elephants around and maybe tomorrow if it's a hot day they'll be around Chitwe in the morning or in the afternoon because it still seems as though very little is going on. I found no tracks for elephants anywhere. I've really seen very little of the elephants at all. Mm, I wonder if maybe Chitwe Dam or what do you think? VM for sunset? Chitwe Dam or maybe? Right while well, I decide to try and find the best spot for our sunset because it looks like it will be spectacular I believe Jamie is still hunkered down in her tent but she wants to discuss the feathery friends that she has around that area are down not so much just for the rain but also for the wind because it is howling out there and I think that were we to put the covers up even if the rain is lessened a little bit there's a very good chance my hat complete with microphone and possibly hair would disappear off somewhere in the direction of Tanzania so we're still sitting here still waiting patiently for the quite violent storm to finish off the last of its dramatics essentially so I'm still sitting here chatting away uh, please keep sending through your questions because they do help because obviously I'm just literally sitting here chatting but of course it does also give Tristan a chance to take a gulp of water take a breath and breathe in and out so James Richard thank you for sending through your questions since you asked you want to know what birds I'm looking forward to seeing in Uganda uh, but there's still lists I'm still going through the different lists and building up what I want to see but great blue Taraco quite high up there on my list of things I would really like to see. Um, the sad thing about the, the Tarakas is apparently they're hunted for meat and their feathers are something that is very highly prized, which is quite sad to hear. I suppose the fate of a, a, a great number of our wildlife. 
So I really want to see the great blue Taraco. I also wanted to show you this. That is a standard winged nightjar. That I would very much like to see as well. Standard winged nightjar. Then there's a barbet that Brent says he's seen it when we've been staying at Old Shaiki. I haven't seen one. I think I've heard them, but I haven't seen one. But I, it, the picture on the place that we're staying's website has a picture of one of them. So I'm assuming they see them quite regularly. And I really want to see one of these. Where, where's it gone? It's a double-toothed barbet. Oh, I didn't know you could enlarge the pictures. How much of an idiot am I? Double toothed barbet. Just purely because it looks so utterly peculiar. And apparently we will see them in Entebbe, according to the people that we're staying with. And their garden is right on or close to Lake Victoria. So I want to see a double toothed barbet. And then lastly, for now, my list is still being built up. I would like to see, and I don't know what the chances of that are, but you never know, I might get lucky. I would like to see a green-breasted pitta. Now it's going to be highly entertaining. It's a pity, it's, uh, I think we're only going to end up being there for around about 10 or so days, but I would really like to continue to explore. I'm also getting to see a friend that I haven't seen since we were in high school together, who lives in Kampala, so I'm quite excited about that as well. We haven't seen each other in 10 years. Yeah, we haven't seen each other in 10 years, so that'll really be quite special to catch up. Riti. Hmm, the most popular bird in the Mara. With other birds or with people? I mean, because there's some very cool birds out there that are, and some birds that are definitely disliked more than others. Um, some of the eagle species being a good example. I don't know, because I've never taken guests out in the Mara. I would say probably the lilac-breasted roller draws some oohs and ahs from first-time safari goers. I think we all get a little bit... I, I think we just take it for granted sometimes. It's such a beautiful bird that we, we completely forget how lovely it is. And, and I was reminded of that when Manu saw his very first lilac-breasted roller. And I remembered just how pretty they were because I tend to drive past them these days. So a lilac-breasted roller might be quite a popular one. I bet the crowned cranes are very popular. I bet that they, they are a crowd pleaser of note. And in fact, in terms of the birds I've seen the guides stopping at, I would say... Ground hornbill, secretary birds, and crowned cranes are the only ones I've ever seen people really paying attention to who are not birders. Obviously, there are phot photographic groups, and there are groups of people who are regular safari goers who have seen lions and cheetah and so on and elephants before, and they also want to focus on the birds as well. But I would say it's it's a little bit of a, a, diff a difficult one. You know what? I could ask one of the guides and find out exactly which bird is the most popular. It's a shame because there really are some extraordinary birds out here. I also always feel a little bit sorry for people who, who've who come out and then are met with weather like this because it must be quite dramatic. Riti, yes, absolutely. Vultures and eagles will, will kill other birds. So I think it was actually Brent who was chatting about it. Was it yesterday already? Um, he was chatting about the certain types of vultures actually smashing eggs with rocks. And eagles uh, eagles will kill baby birds if they happen upon them. Uh, something like a baby ostrich would be a very good example. An eagle will swoop down and grab a baby ostrich. We've seen harrier hawks, the, the gymnogenes or the harrier hawks. They're not eagles, but they are they are related to them in some way. They're a bird of prey. They go and actually actively dig their feet into hollows of trees. And that's something that you will see on Juma. And it's always quite an extraordinary sighting, actually, to watch them dig their feet and their claws into trees backwards, forwards, because they've got special joints. And they pull out baby birds and eggs all the time. So absolutely, they would. There'll be quite a few. Mongoose? Well, I mean, now we're talking not birds. But there's no reason for them not to. They, they're birds but they're di babies of different species and it's good protein for them so yes absolutely they will 
I really, really want to see a baby ostrich. We haven't seen one yet here. I'm sure it's going to happen at some point. Possibly on the other side of the river where the grass is shorter, because at the moment we're not even going to spot them. April, technically, I'm pretty sure I'm not meant to recommend a particular bird guide or um, or anything like that. And I think the reason behind that, of course, is because someone somewhere will get greatly offended with me if I were to recommend one book and not the other. And uh, so, no, technically, unfortunately, I'm not really meant to. And you'll notice when we open out our books, we tend not to show the front cover, except by mistake when it happens. So, you know what, just keep watching and sometimes accidents happen. But no. Technically, I'm not allowed to recommend certain guides, and everybody's got their favorites as well. So, you know what? If you have a look around, there's a couple of really, really... Newman's is a really good brand. There's a couple of really good ones, and you can't go wrong with any of the top guides. Really, you can't. Uh, there's, there's a truly hilarious East African book that is somewhere, and I... It's a bird book that was bought into James's studio, and I never found it from the first day that it arrived. It has the most passive-aggressive sentence I've ever seen in any, any book ever, let alone a reference book. Um, and it's basically about how in, because you know, South African, South Africa was one of the sort of the, the, the pioneers of this whole process of standardizing bird names. And it obviously hasn't fully caught on in certain places. So essentially there's been a great argument between East African birders and ornithologists and Southern African birders and ornithologists about the true definition of a spurfowl and a Franklin. Now, in my head, this has split up many a family. It's caused arguments at family dinners. Um, it's caused a great Romeo and Juliet style love story between the two children of different ornithologists who do different beliefs. I don't know. But essentially, in the in this book, it, it says... The, the way that South Africans, South Africans believe this to be a spur file and this to be a Franklin, and we believe it to be the other way around. And then just the last sentence just says, it's a fun game we play, full stop. <laughs> so that's one of my favorite things to see. I can't even remember what book, book it was, and I can't, I've never found it again. So it was something I've been wanting to show you for, for weeks, but I can't find the book. It's gone vanished into James's studio somewhere, hidden in the piles of books. Okay, I think we're going to brave moving on. Um, I think we might be okay. Let's send you across, though, to Tristan, who's got uh, some exciting news for you. I do indeed. We, you can see we are not at Chitwa Dam anymore. We are raced back to Juma because somebody heard a leopard sawing around Chelapan. And guess where we are? We're at Chelapan. So we're going to sit here and we're going to just turn off for a little bit and try and listen. And maybe, just maybe, we get lucky. Maybe Tingana or somebody is around that is making this noise. Either way, there must be somewhere fairly close because... The person that heard it was at Twin Dams, and so this is not very far from Twin Dams. You would be able to hear and pinpoint exactly. And now if we just turn off, it might be the perfect place just to listen and hear. Maybe we hear a monkey alarm calling, maybe we hear Franklin's alarm calling, or we hear the sawing itself. And while we're sitting here, we do have a beautiful view of the South African sunset. Uh, the sun has gone down, granted, but look at those cloud formations and the colors within them, and the dead tree kind of adds a bit of atmosphere to that. It almost looks like a whirlwind, but it is very pretty out here this afternoon. It is wonderfully sort of mixed contrast of colors and patterns of clouds it is very very nice now i'm not sure where else to check out what i wanted to do is actually just get to chelapan and stop and listen and so we admiring the sunset but it's, it's part and reason is just to kind of listen and hear and, and maybe we get lucky with some sort of sound just just to indicate exactly where we got to go what i want to try and do quickly before we go any further or before we kind of hang around too much is i just want to check the pangolin track pan because it is a place where some of our leopards will drink chiller pan looks as though nothing is here so i don't think there's anything on that side and apparently it, the sound wasn't coming from the mulawati it was coming more from kind of this direction so chiller pan going more towards the western side so i don't know it might be 
worth also trying to just kind of carry on up towards Gauri Dam. So those of you that are watching the dam cam, if you can keep a lookout and maybe it shows up on the dam cam itself and you can help us by seeing if there is a leopard moving in that direction. So that's the kind of plan. We've at least got our bases covered. There is one other vehicle that is helping us check the area and just sort of having a scan around and look around as well. And so that will also just aid in being able to maybe find something but I don't see anything as a Deka here that looks very relaxed and certainly not too stressed about things. No, nothing here. Alright, VM, what do you think? Philemon's cut line and then Ingwe Alley. Maybe. That's not a bad idea. Ingwe Alley is not a bad place as the name suggests. And Ingwe being a leopard is a good place to have a look around. So that's where we'll maybe go and check. Although I have this funny feeling if it's Tingana, his route around Chelapan does take him often up the Mulawati from Chelapan and then northwards. Or he could be going east-west, he could be going west-east. It's difficult to know without picking up a track somewhere that we can at least use as an indication but there's a number of herbivorous animals in this area there's a daker back there there's some water buck on my left hand side so i don't think there's a leopard calling from here because these animals would be far more alert than what they are there's the water buck on that side but i did remember i did say earlier that there was alarm calls of kudu around ingas so i did hear alarm calls and so maybe that's where this leopard has been it's just been sleeping close to to this area and it's now up and moving and that's why so if it was around Ingers it could be either way it could be either coming south towards Ingwe Alley or it could be going north towards the dam itself so it could be either one but I'm sure those alarm calls that I heard must be for the same individual and it's exciting either way at the end of the day oh no Demi from Vancouver, you say it's time we saw Tingana on patrol. Uh, well, I hope so. Uh, it would be nice. It's been a long time since we've seen Tingana. When was the last time we saw him on patrol in this area? We saw him obviously with the two boys on the kill at Chitwa, but very little has been seen of, well, we haven't seen much of him on Juma itself. So, just double checking. I, I'm going a little quicker than I normally would because hopefully I can try and catch this leopard out in the open. Obviously it could be calling from a thicket, it could be anywhere, but I'm just hoping it's gone for water and it's just striding around the open and I'll be able to see it. That's my plan at least. And I believe the dam cam is down as well, which is not ideal because I have a sneaky suspicion that this leopard might be heading towards that area. But I'm going to do Ingwe Alley anyway because there's a number of water points there. Nothing there, then up Twin Dams towards Gauri Dam and then we're at least covering all the water points and making double sure that we're not in a situation where we are sort of missing any of the water sections where a leopard could potentially drink. After a hot day like today, I think that's where a leopard would go. If I was a leopard, that's where I would go. And so maybe we'll get lucky, but let's just check and double check and triple check this area. Becca, you're asking if leopards' territories are much smaller than a lion's territory. Well, Becca, no, not necessarily. It all depends on density of lion and, and, and leopard. So if you've got a situation like here in the Sabi Sands where the density of leopards is very big, then you're going to see that you'll find the territories are very small for those leopards. I mean, if there's a, yeah, a lot of density, small territory. Whereas if you go to some parts of the Kalahari, those leopards have massive territories. Some of a female leopard there will hold a territory that is in maybe even double the size of the Sabi sand so that's a it's a very different situation according to density and it will be the same thing with lions so difficult to draw comparisons between the two you can't really say that lions have bigger territories although in general because there's a lot more miles to feed generally the lions will try and push out and expand but if you look in the Mara those lions are all very close to one another there's a lot of different prides that are all in same areas and, and it's been a nightmare for the guys to try and work out which prides are which and where they actually are and so you know we end up with a situation where um, there the, the density is much lower than maybe here and I mean higher than maybe here and, and that's why the territories there are smaller than what we might see here so in this particular reserve the lion's territories are bigger than the leopards um, but in others it might be a little bit different hmm I don't know so much Vildi
Stephen, yes, female leopards will soar. Most certainly, they do soar like the males. It's not as deep and as as sort of far carrying, but they most definitely will soar, and so you will get a situation where a female leopard does. I mean, Tandi has been soaring recently, and I've heard females do it regularly. Funny enough, Salahesh was a female that used to soar a lot, and Karula, actually. Karula, we, we saw her soaring quite a number of times, but Salahesh was probably the female I heard the most. It was actually amazing how often she used to soar for no reason at all. I mean, she used to have a cub, and she was still soaring and carrying on, so it, it just depends on the individual, but yes, females do soar and do so regularly okay so nothing out here that I can see no tracks hmm, what do you think Vim? Juma Dam? Gary Dam? there's a diker there and there's a scrub here hello scrub here what are you doing out so early it's frozen still we might as well just turn off and listen again while we sitting with the scrub here and just maybe we hear out that scrub hair looks petrified, doesn't it? It almost looks as though it's completely nerve-wracked. I think that it's maybe thinking about the fact that this are, it's got to get going and start to actually move around during the night and many things lurk. And if it's hearing a leopard already, then oh, I suppose it, I would be nervous too if I was a scrub hair. Shame. They have a tough time, these little guys, between the owls and the leopards and the snakes and the all the other sort of prey or oh, predator species that we get out here it's not an easy life for a little scrub here but I don't hear anything more hmm I don't know we're going to try and carry on sorry little scrub here I didn't mean to give you a fright but I would really like it if you moved off the road I know that you are just as important as a leopard but we do want to see a leopard and I've starved VM and I've made him film all kinds of things today from plants and birds and all kinds of other things so I think I owe VM a leopard for all his hard work today and his long stints that he's done so I'm going to try and find a leopard and while I do that I believe Jamie I don't know if she's moving and is actually able to move I hope that she is but if she is well I think she still wants to discuss her feathery friends and hopefully it won't be too wet Nothing makes VM's day more than actually finding a leopard. So I'm wishing Tristan the best of luck and you're going to do, listen to me gabble on for a little bit while Tristan tries to concentrate on finding that leopard. And I know it's quite tricky sometimes to try and look and present. And not that Tristan's ever had a problem finding a leopard before, let's be honest. But essentially just to give him a little bit of time to concentrate. So, Megs, I've completely forgotten the name of both people who asked the questions. I'm really sorry. I was thinking about the questions themselves, not the not the people. So the first one was about the largest bird, flying bird in the Mara, obviously realizing, there we go, Alice, oh wait, that was the other question, Becca, Becca, there we go. So we'll start with Becca's question and we'll get round to Alison's question in a moment. So Becca, the largest flying bird that we, well the heaviest flying bird that we get out here is the Cory Bustard. And I've just been trying to work out if it's actually the, I don't think it's the tallest flying bird, but I do think it might have one of the largest wingspans. And I'm trying to think, I mean a Marshall Eagle has a massive wingspan, but it doesn't quite match that of a Cory Bustard, which apparently can have a wingspan of up to 250 centimeters, so two and a half meters, and around about nine feet. I didn't know that off the top of my head. I looked it up. So I'm trying to think if perhaps that might have the largest wingspan as well, but then what about a leopard-faced vulture? Let's find out what the leopard-faced vulture's wingspan is. That doesn't help me. It doesn't tell me. Doesn't tell me what the wingspan. So there we go. Homework for all of you. You can try and work out what has the longest, the biggest wingspan of any of the birds out here. I have a feeling I'm forgetting one that's obvious. Marshall Eagle doesn't have a wingspan that beats that of a big male Cory Bustard, apparently. Um, so that would be the answer. And a, a Cory Bustard can weigh up to 17 kilograms, and that reminds me, actually, one of the things I was going to do, but then I got distracted by the next question, one of the things I was going to do was show you the screenshot of what that bird looks like next to me. Because I got out, and then our very kind 
multiple very kind viewers actually sent through a Photoshop picture, but it's going to take me too long to look for now. Unfortunately, I'll have to do that for my next segment because I won't be able to find it in time. Well, I, I will. It'll just take me a while and it'll get very boring for you to try and watch me try and find the picture, so I'm not going to do that. And the, the internet's also down. I've just realized on this car, so I'm not doing anything. Next question was from Alison. Was it? Yes, Alison, you wanted to know which bird I have wanted to see and I have not yet seen. And you, do you want to know what I just did, Alison? I just put your name into the index instead of the bird I wanted to talk about. So I looked for you in the um, in the birding app. That little bird. That little bird over there. I was so disappointed because when I. Th before I got here, Brent was here for about a month before I was, and just about two weeks before I left, he told me he'd been on a mission to go and see the blue swallows. And when I arrived, there was no time to go and see the blue swallows, and so I never got to see them. And it was the f they they haven't really been recorded to be in this part of the Mara. It was all the way down towards the bo the border of Tanzania, so right in that little corner where they might be. It was towards Ngirare, and I was deeply, deeply saddened that I missed out on seeing them, and we've never seen them since. So, unfortunately, apparently, it only happens every now and again that they go wandering into that corner, and I missed it. So there you go, that was the bird. And flamingos. We were going to go and see the flamingos, and then it, it didn't quite happen for one reason or another. I'm starting to get very uncomfortable, I'm sorry. I'm sitting still for too long. I didn't get to see the flamingos. We were going to go to Nakuru and go around that area and go and look for them, and we just haven't got around to it yet. But there's a big yet involved in all of these birds that I haven't yet seen. The double-toothed barbet... And there's one other one that I keep looking forward, old Shaiki. Yes, Kathy, absolutely, secretary birds do fly. Now you've thrown me into a turmoil. I don't think their wingspan is greater than the Cory Bustard. Probably not, because as the heaviest flying bird, it would make sense that a Cory Bustard would have to f have really big wings to tr to get it airborne. So, yes, absolutely, secretary birds do fly. They're actually quite elegant flyers, I think, for an animal that is not really geared towards, it's more geared towards walking than it is towards flying. They nest on the top of trees. We know of a few secretary bird nests that we check up on every now and again and just see whether there's any sign of egg laying or chicks. So, yes, secretary birds do fly, and they really are very pretty birds. I, did, I think we mentioned them earlier. Yes, we said they were probably one of the most popular birds of the Mara. It's hard to ignore them. Oh, Marabou Stork. There we go. A Marabou Stork for coming through from James Richard. Absolutely. You see, I knew I was forgetting one of the obvious ones. And Marabous are huge. Are they taller than Cory Bustards? Probably. Now that I think about it, they probably are. I'll tell you what I'll do is uh, a little bit while you're with Tristan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a look around and see if I can find the screenshots that everybody put together. Because I never really thanked people properly because I was on the other side of the river. Okay, I was hoping I might have some good news for you, but you never know. The sunset safari is not over. Let's go across to Tristan, who's arrived at the dam. I have arrived. I'm at Juma Dam, Gauri Dam, whichever one you want to call it. And we are trying to see if there's any sign of a leopard here. There is no sign. There's some warthogs that are busy running away in the distance. Goodbye, warthogs. Quickly, off you go. If there's a leopard around, you don't want to be caught down near the dam. And you can see a beautiful reflection of color in the water itself. So no leopard here. If there was a leopard, I don't think we would be seeing warthogs. I certainly don't think there would be impalas, nyala, guinea fowls, and various other types of herbivorous animals hanging around with if a leopard was in sight so I don't think the leopard has come this way just yet but we're still trying to find I haven't found any tracks it's obviously getting quite dark now so tracking is becoming very difficult and well I'm just hoping for the best so I'm just driving around and just trying to see all the points where I would think a leopard would go in this hot weather but so far no sign just yet maybe it's still somewhere inside one of the blocks and hasn't just come out yet but you never know Tingana is famous for his last 
last-minute leopard stint. And so we're not quite really there for a Tingana last-minute leopard just yet. We need probably another few minutes and then he would like to show himself. So maybe we get lucky. I again just turned off just to listen because at the end of the day this is the only way I can rely on actually trying to figure out where this is. I haven't actually heard him yet and or her depending on which one it is and so I'm just shooting in the dark basically going in blind almost so to speak and just trying to kind of think of places that might be worth checking from sort of Chelapan northwards in case. I mean obviously it could have gone south but I don't think so because there was vehicles that checked south of us and, and, and to the west of us and so the only other place could be the Mulawati. Obviously if he's inside the Mulawati or she's inside the Mulawati it's very difficult to see them from Chelapan north because there's really no road that goes up that way and walking inside there is a bit of a minefield for the vehicle. So I was hoping to get some sort of audio in the times that we've been s sort of turned off but unless nothing just yet so Vim what do you think should we do one more trip down Twin Dams Road yeah, let's, go back to... let's go back let's do that let's go turn around first because we're not going to be able to reverse I suppose I could reverse down it's not too bad down here we'll just reverse our way back off the dam wall quickly and there's nothing that I can see south of the dam wall I've just had a little kind of look around as well while we're reversing just to check if there's anything it doesn't seem to be anything that I can pick up obviously it's also getting quite dark so not easy to pick up a leopard in this kind of light so yesterday with Tundi she just started disappearing on us because their coat just blends in so well in this dreary kind of dim twilight and it becomes quite tough to actually see them so hopefully if it does walk around it will be on the road somewhere and we can be able to then see it can I keep going there Vildi we good we're negotiating our way around. Well done to us. Thanks, Vildi. Now, let's see. I think tree out. We go to Tundams. Check Chelapan one more time. Maybe you never know. It's popped out again somewhere in that general vicinity. There's a lot of animals that are up on quarantine. So if that leopard walked quarantine way, we would have heard it. We would have heard a lot of noise. Now, apparently my mic is making a little bit of noise. Vildi is it's muffled. Oh, it slipped out of my hat. Sorry, Vildi. Sorry, everybody. Just give me two seconds while I quickly fix my hat and... There we go. Is that better, VM? There we go. Well done. Little maintenance job on the way as we're moving around. It's all this excitement about leopard. I get too excited and move around too much and then pull the cable out. Roshni, you're asking if the leopard density in the Sabi sands affects the lion population. Um, not really. Uh, you will find the odd leopard killing a lion cub here and there, but it's not that common. Um, so no, not really. Um, things that will affect lion populations here in the Sabi sands uh, is prey availability, so lack of buffalo is certainly a big problem. Um, then also drought, we saw last year with the mange, it can be quite, quite debilitating. Also that white muscle disease from lack of nutrients from the prey that they're catching can be a problem. Um, hyenas are a very big problem for lions. A lot of hyenas kill lion cubs when they're still young. So that can be a problem on, on density of lions. So those are the real kind of big problems that our lions in the Sabi Sands face. Um, there's not really too much in the way of leopard. Leopard really, even though they're densely populated here, they generally are going to try and steer clear of a lion they're not going to really want to take a lion on too much at the end of the day a lion is a very dangerous animal and even going where you see lion cubs and no lioness you never know if that lioness is going to arrive back and so you don't want to go and mess around with cubs and generally it's really only the big males that would try and go after a lion cub and try and cause some sort of an issue so no leopards aren't too much of a threat to our lions here it's more drought and food availability and hyenas that are the problem. Liam, I think I should get my spotlight out. Hampus, you're asking if I remember how old I was when I went on safari for the first time. Now Hampus, I am just busy trying to find my spotlight so if you'll bear with me I will be with you shortly sorry I just want to try and get the spotlight because it's getting too dark for me to spot anything oh, and I'm not trying to crash as well so we're gonna try and get everything all at once where's the spotlight oh, this where the spotlight is the spotlights all the way down here right next to me 
Hello, Spotlight. Of course, that's where it would be. Now, the first time I went on safari, uh, I went with my grandparents when I was, I think the first recollection I can have was about six years old. Five, six, five years old actually probably is about the first time. Um, I might have gone before that, but I honestly don't remember. Um, so about five, six when I can start having my earliest memories and then many, many times after that. So I was really fortunate to be able to go on those and to be able to at least remember those. And like I say, I might have gone earlier, but I can't remember. And, and unfortunately, my grandparents are no longer with me. But I would hope maybe my brother will remember, so I'll ask my brother and find out, but somewhere around there. I might have gone when I was three or four, but the thing is, is that taking a baby in a car to the Kruger National Park is a tough ask. It gets hot, it's, it's often long hours of driving in the car with very little entertainment for a, a three-year-old child, and so it's not an easy place. To kind of take kids and that's why often people will take kids a little bit older i know some of my friends that have had kids in the bush and they already have taken their kids on safaris at three four months old and and so there's some kids that are very spoiled and but i count myself incredibly lucky i was fortunate enough to at least be able to do this and to live in a, in a country where we are able to get out and and to go and see a lot of the wildlife and and go and, and kind of experience these kind of things it's a very special thing to be able to do and we really are fortunate Right, now, Jamie, who's been an absolute superstar and a rock star and has really helped us out this afternoon under quite trying conditions, apparently is still stuck in her little makeshift tent in the middle of the Maasai Mara. And I really do need to say a big thank you to Jamie for helping me and just giving me a slight break this afternoon. And she wants to discuss some more birds. Well, Tristan's been the superstar today. He's had to basically carry the can for all the gremlin attacks that we've had in the Mara. So, right, chat time with Jamie. This should be, this should, this should be, no, Brent, you can't phone me now. Go away. I'm busy. Sorry. Um, I needed my phone on because I was waiting for a picture from Faith. So, this is Faith's picture that she sent through. It's a screenshot from Carrie. Thank you to Faith for doing that. That is the Cory Busted and myself as a size comparison. Admittedly, not the largest size comparison we've ever seen. But there we go. Thank you to Carrie. This has got sunblock fingers all over my screen, but it seems to work quite well. There you go. The heaviest flying bird, just in terms of size. And dwarfed completely by my massive uh, Talex special flip-flops. Talex a village, by the way. And they have one size of flip-flop only. Right, so we have a question quickly about the smaller birds of the Mara and the small list birds. Meg, I'm sorry, I've forgotten again. I don't know what's wrong with my memory. Uh, my first answer straight off sort of the top of my head was penduline tit because that's the smallest bird in Africa. And you get the southern penduline tit. But it doesn't look oh sorry Anna I'm so sorry I, I don't know why my brain's not working but that was a question from Anna it doesn't look like the, uh, the penduline tits actually occur here or if they do that's right on the boundary I don't quite know what that dotted line over there means I think it's to do with subspecies <coughs> so there's a, dif a difference between the two subspecies there <coughs> <coughs> so that might occur here so there you go, that would be the smallest ones. So the tits, the cysticulars, the waxbills, the ptilias, all of these are tiny, tiny, very pretty little birds. And it actually brings us to the next question, which is, it connects because they're one of the smallest birds as well. Uh, we do get sunbirds here, and this was, was it somebody pickle? What is wrong with my brain? Megan, please could I have the second question, who the second question was from again? I'm sorry. Ah, oh, I didn't imagine the pickle. It was Gillian C. Pickle. Um, you wanted to know. We don't get hummingbirds, no, but we do get sunbirds. And we get some really lovely sunbirds. And the other day, I saw for the very first time a sunbird called a beautiful sunbird. No, I can't find it. Wait, was it called a beautiful one or a splendid one? Sorry, I think it was... No, it was a beautiful one. 
Maybe it was a splendid one. No, I can't find it. Now I'm vaguely scared that I imagined that entire experience. Maybe it wasn't a beautiful at all. There are so many sunbirds. There are so many sunbirds here. No, it was a beautiful sunbird, and I didn't imagine it. There you go. I saw one of those for the first time. And that was at Old Shaiki, which is where we go and stay when we're across the river. Oh, there you go. A beautiful sunbird. And now I have run out of things that I can think to tell you about birds. I think I have, I have thoroughly exhausted the topic for this evening, um, given that we are trapped in our tent, which means that we can slowly but surely start heading home. So thank you, everybody, for putting up the putting up with all the gremlins that we've had over the last few days. It's one of those things we will get on top of them, as we always do. Right, bravo, off to our hero of the day, Mr. Tristan, and let's go see if he can find you some nocturnal flighted creatures. Well, no nocturnal birds yet, Jamie, and I don't think a hero of the day would be in any way appropriate. I think we've everybody's had to pull some weight at some point and had to do slightly longer segments and longer links and or well, not links but longer stints, should I say? And so, really, not a hero at all. I think our tech team are more heroes than anybody else when we've got such a kind of an uphill battle with internet and things that is not really related to the guys on the ground. It's unfortunately service providers and various other things, but I think they've done very well. And like I say, Jamie and Brent this afternoon have been absolute troopers considering the adverse weather conditions and various other technical problems that they've had. It's been a great help to have them this afternoon. I've certainly appreciated every minute of it. And like I say, it takes a team effort to get the things done. And so all is good. But in terms of nocturnal birds, unfortunately not, and not even our nocturnal rasping, sawing leopard at this stage. There's still no sign, no more audio nobody has heard anything more everyone's still driving around checking looking but nothing that we can see and so I don't know maybe this leopard is still somewhere in this thicket and unfortunately it's just not come out yet and we are still kind of driving around but no sign as yet and hopefully there will be some sign at some point maybe you never know the last minute we've had Tingana do it before on quarantine where he pops out at the last second in fact I didn't even know he had popped out he was walking behind me while I was saying goodbye to all of you and so it does happen from time to time and maybe that's what is going to happen tonight I certainly won't complain if it does but if it doesn't well it's still been a fun day and it's added a bit of excitement to the end of our drive as we've driven around and we've looked and we've tried and we've kind of scanned everywhere and we've gotten our spotlight out and we've listened and it's allowed us to discuss a lot of different things so I'm certainly won't be too upset if we don't find it I would always Rita you asking about an owl mm, I'll try my very best it's quarantine's actually not a bad place for owls so I will try my very best and we've had a good run of owls actually it seems as though we've had an owl on the last two drives so maybe we will finish up with one we don't have that much time left unfortunately so I'm gonna try and see if I can find an owl in one of these bigger trees as we go along quarantine they are a pair of scops owls that live at Inga's so let's have a look and see Umka, you're saying it's strange that we rarely see the bats. Well, Umka, the reason why is because the bats fly incredibly fast and it's difficult for the cameraman to focus on various things um, when they, or various fast flying things in the air when it's so small and it's dark, it's really not easy at all. But there, I can tell you when we drive like this at night, we see a lot of bats. There are a lot of bats around. Unfortunately, we just don't get to film them as much as we'd want to now. We've come up onto quarantine and there are pretty much impalas everywhere. I'm just scanning for those owls for you, Riti, but no, unfortunately not. So I think that's unfortunately going to be the end of it for us. I don't think we're going to find Tingana or whoever this was that was making a noise. I think unfortunately that's going to be it 
for us, I don't think it's going to pop out on quarantine given the amount of animals that are around. Although you never know, there could all of a sudden be an absolute explosion and, and a leopard could pop out here. But like I say, there's been no more sign of it. There's no tracks that I can see heading up into this way and no more audio. So unfortunately, like I said, I think that's it for us. We'll have to just try again tomorrow morning. And that's the beauty of being out here is that we do get to try again tomorrow. But from Jamie, who is I'm sure a bit soggy and wet, and Brent, who I'm sure has had a rather long day with these cheetahs, if it sounds like a nice day, I'm sure they send their very best. And from myself and Viam and Megan and Ashley in the FC, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we'll see you on the Sunrise Safari.